So it is 7.33 p.m. It is August 29th, 2023. Good evening. My name is Christian Klein. I am the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals, and I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. First, I would like to confirm that all members and anticipated officials are present. Uh, from the Zoning Board of Appeals, Roger DuPont. Here. Uh, Patrick Hanlon. I'm here. Venkat Hoy. Here. And Elaine Hoffman. Here. Good to have you all with us tonight. Uh, Mr. Riccadelli and Mr. LeBlanc are both unable to join us this evening, uh, but we still have a, a full uh, slate of five members present. Um, on behalf of the town, we have Colleen Ralston, the zoning assistant. Here. Good to have you with us. Uh, and then just running through the dockets, um, appearing on behalf of docket 375832 Appleton Street, uh, is Jenna Francis with us? I see her box on the Zoom screen. Um, appearing for docket 37615 Mystic Lake Drive, uh, Robert Nessi. It looks like it's he's connecting to audio from my screen. Oh, oh you're right. Yep. So it does appear that he is present. Um, Appearing for docket 3762, 148 Mount Vernon Street, uh, Allison and Brian Lasco. Yep, we're here. Good to see you. Thank you. Appearing for docket 3763, excuse me, 56 Newcomb Street, uh, Nancy and Michael Flynn. We're here. Good to see you. And you appearing for docket 3764, 212 Pleasant Street, uh, Nellie Aikenhead. Here. Good to see you as well. Um, so this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely, consistent with an act making appropriations for the fiscal year 2023 to provide for supplementing certain existing appropriations and for certain other activities and projects signed into law on March 29th, 2023. This act includes an extension until March 31st, 2025 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Public bodies may continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the public body physically present at a meeting location, so long as they provide adequate alternative access to remote meetings. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom application with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference, others are participating by computer audio or by telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. And as chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. As the board will be taking up new business at this meeting, as chair, I make the following land acknowledgement. Whereas the Zoning Board of Appeals for the Town of Arlington, Massachusetts discusses and arbitrates the use of land in Arlington, formerly known as monotomy, an Algonquin word meaning swift waters, the board hereby acknowledges that the Town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts territories today. Uh, the first Three items on our agenda are administrative items. I'm gonna move those to the end of the meeting um, so that we can move forward with uh, the bulk of our meeting tonight. We do have many items on the agenda. Um, before I select uh, the first item, um, I did want to ask a question of one of our applicants, um, which is Ms. Aikenhead. Um, I understand the department uh, the Inspection Services Department issued a memo late this afternoon, or you know, sort of at some point during the day today, um, outlining a, that they have uh, a difference of opinion on a certain uh, dimension, 
And my understanding is that you may want to uh, request a continuance. And if that's the case, I would go ahead and move that first, uh, knowing that I think the bulk of the people who are here this evening are here specifically for that hearing. I, I would like to re request a continuance. We got that memo maybe half an hour, an hour ago. We're not prepared to discuss it. We don't understand it yet. So I think it would be better just to put everything off until a okay. future meeting, if that's acceptable. So let me go ahead. I will open the hearing on, on 212. Um, I will explain what the memo is, and then um, we'll continue with it. We'll move on to the continuance. Um, so moving on to public hearings, uh, here's some ground rules for effective conduct of tonight's business. After I announce each agenda item, I will ask the applicants to introduce themselves or themselves, make their presentation to the board. I will request members of the board to ask questions they have on the proposal. And after the board's questions have been and answered, I will open the meeting for public comment. At the conclusion of public comment, the board will deliberate and vote on the matter. Any vote taken at this hearing will be preliminary until the written decision is approved by the board at a subsequent meeting. All votes will be conducted by roll call. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to take uh, item nine on our agenda, which is docket 3764 212 Pleasant Street, um, and bring that forward. Um, and just the, so there was a memo released um, by Inspectional Services, uh, which I will go ahead here and display. Uh, so, is, so effectively, Inspectional Services has calculated the average grade for 212 Pleasant Street based upon request. The average grade was calculated twice by two different inspectors. The result was an average grade elevation of 12.71 with a basement ceiling elevation of 19. This office has determined that the basement ceiling of 6.29 feet above average grade and per the town of Arlington zoning bylaw definition of a story, it constitutes a story. Um, the elevation, the average grade elevation in, this, in the plans provided by the applicant was, was at a significantly higher position, uh, which made the lowest level not a story. And uh, for that reason, as, as we briefly discussed, um, I would ask Ms. Aikenhead if she would like to uh, request a continuance in order to um, evaluate this new information. Uh, yes, please. I would like to request a continuance to better understand how the building department did their calculations and what is, I guess, an error potentially with our calculations, which were done by a licensed surveyor. I think it would be better to ha further this, have further conversations about this when we're, there's more information than this memo. Okay. Thank you. Um, Ask Mr. Hanlon, do you see any issue with us moving forward with a continuance um, at this time? Mr. Chairman, no, I don't see any. As long as the applicant is consenting with that, uh, it seems to me that it would save everybody a lot of time to get to understand this recent development and for everybody to be uh, uh, playing with a full deck. So it seems to me that it's it's an appropriate thing to do if, Mrs., if the applicant requests it. Okay. Um, with that, um, I will go ahead. Um, I'll stop the share on that. Um, and I will, Mr. Uh, Hamlin, can I ask for a motion to that effect? Um, Excuse me. Uh, I apologize. I, I didn't mean to interrupt. This is um, Attorney Sarah Radigan. Mr. Chairman, would you allow um, me an opportunity to speak before you take the vote on the continuance? Um, are you looking to present uh, testimony or? Uh, this would be um, some 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 questions, um, procedural questions um, about the status of, of the matter, and then also um, also, first, I'm sorry, just to clarify, I represent um, the neighboring property owners at 214 uh, Pleasant Street, um, Ms. Sabrina Howe mm -hmm. and Mr. John Garber, who are on the Zoom call as well. And as you know, they submitted a letter to the um, to the board um, outlining yeah. some concerns. There, um, these are some technical um, points that I just wanted to ask this board about before the case is continued. I think if we um, can... If we can limit it to uh, sort of technical questions about the based on procedural matters, yes, um, that that's like what that. I was going to suggest. I, what I 
and with with apologies to the many people who are on this call uh, specifically for this hearing. Um, I don't want to get into a place where we sort of hear the whole hearing tonight, knowing that we're just going to continue anyways. Um, and so I would really rather, if we can keep it to procedural matters, I would appreciate that. Sure. The first one is just a, a request for a clarification. Um, the, the petitioner's letter to the board suggested that this was a, a quote unquote reopening of a hearing. And I just wanted to, to ask um, this board if this is a new application or no. if this is a continued uh, matter from the previous application. Oh, thank you. Um, so the previous application was withdrawn. And so this is considered a new application. Um, I, there was some confusion, I believe, when this was initially uh, requested to be put back in, the thought was that it was just, it could be reopened and, um, but no, it has a new docket number. It is a new hearing. And then the follow-up question to that is, do the, does the board need to make a decision about allowing a repeated petition since the substantive plans haven't changed in terms of what's being requested? So the request was to, uh, to withdraw and it, the request was, uh, allowed without prejudice. And so the board um, is allowing the petition to be the, excuse me, the application to be resubmitted. Th thank you, I, I understand, thank you. Um, so just the um, two, two other, three other comments, uh, questions and requests that I wanted to put out there. And again, this is, I'm trying not to get into the substance Appreciate of the that. hearing. Um, the, the issue of the question of whether the basement was a story um, came about by um, some sort of difficult processing of the application materials by um, my clients who were trying to understand how the calculations of average grade mm -hmm. were made. And the difficulty they had was that the proposed site plan, part of the difficulty was that the proposed site plan did not show elevation levels or what points were taken for their calculations. And so this is just simply a request that this board request that the applicant do um, a little bit more um, of a thorough job of showing their um, information on a proposed site plan that we can then review as well. Um, I realize that they'll be going back to the commissioner to get a better understanding of what's going on here. So I'll, I'll leave that to them. Um, the second thing I wanted to mention to this board is that um, we had asked the commissioner um, today if there was another um, one or two special permits that would be necessary for this project, because the property appears to be in two overlay districts. Um, one is the inland wetland district. Um, when you go to the uh, overlay maps, in the Conservation Commission section of the GIS. Um, the property is um, entirely shaded in this, or almost everything but a sliver is shaded with the green color around Spy Pond as being part of the Inland Water District. Mm -hmm. And under section 5.8, um, it refers to um, permitted uses and then from things that are not permitted. And I'm reading from 5.8.4a, which refers to the fact that um, no structure intended for human occupancy, I'm paraphrasing, um, shall be altered, enlarged, or otherwise moved for any purpose unless a special permit from the Board of Appeals is issued. And we spoke to the commissioner. He wasn't sure about this process because he hadn't seen it before and needed to defer to um, a conservation commissioner who he thought might have more information mm -hmm. who is out on vacation this week. But we wanted to bring this to the attention to this board as well um, to, um, you know, to make you aware of that, yep. that that issue was um, one that needs to be addressed. And then just one last process question, which is a request to please have the the applicant um, be required to reach out specifically to the immediate abutters with any revised plans and calculations so that we can have a chance to review this 
before a hearing, not on a sort of an emergency basis and not to mm -hmm. take up the time of this board. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you for allowing me to comment. Certainly. Um, so with that, um, I would like to go ahead and continue um, as a part of the uh, the motion to continue. Um, I think it would be appropriate for the board to request that all new materials be posted, uh, be provided to the board um, a certain amount of time ahead of the, the following hearing. Um, and with that, um, I know that the we typically would do so, you know, typically postings are 48 hours ahead, which for this board means Friday, uh, the end of the day, Friday. Um, and so uh, we could request uh, that time as well. Um, Ms. Aiken had, um, you had, you have your hand up. I don't know that this is the place to debate anything, but I did want to comment on the attorney's comment about the inland wetland district i I, mm -hmm. I am fully prepared to respond to everything in the letter from all the neighbors i was not respond to prepared to respond to the memo from the inspectional services yep. that was posted an hour ago i p did share all my stuff a couple weeks ago we're not in the inland wetland district we are in the upland resource area which is a hundred foot wide buffer around spy pond that is under the jurisdiction of the conservation commission we have completed all the required state and municipal wetland protection filings and permitting requirements. We've completed that in 2022 and we have been issued an order of conditions. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I wondered if, if we're doing a uh, continuance and we do have the ability to plan, this has been around for a while I would like to suggest that all of the parties be asked to get their papers in by Thursday rather than Friday. Uh, Friday puts everybody up against a weekend, which is always a little bit difficult. And the town only is technically open for Friday morning so that it it going Friday is a lot later than Thursday than you'd think as a practical matter. And I figure that that uh, uh, it ought not to be an excessive burden to ask people to have their papers in uh, uh, by the end of the day th Thursday, which gives everybody a little bit more chance to to take uh, to take stock of the papers that are uh, being submitted. Okay. So the next available date we have is September twenty sixth. Um. So we would be looking to continue to September 26 with the with documents provided by end of day September 21, Thursday, September 21. Is that acceptable to the applicant? Yes, that's fine. Okay. Um, then with that, um, Mr. Hamlin, may I have a motion? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move that the uh, application be uh, continued to a date certain of um, 9.26 uh, at 7.30 or as soon thereafter as it may be heard. And that all paper that the board request the applicant and others uh, to provide uh, any written papers that they wish the board to consider uh, by the end of the day, Thursday, uh, September 21st. Second. Thank you, Mr. Dupont. And thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Uh, vote of the board. Uh, this is a motion to continue to date certain of Tuesday, September 26, 2023 at 7.30 p.m. Uh, with uh, new documentation provided by end of day on Thursday, September 21st, 2023. Uh, the roll call vote of the board, Mr. Dupont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. And the chair votes aye. We are continued on 212 Pleasant Street. Uh, thank you all. Um, for thank all you. Of you who, oh, for all of you who came out this evening, thank you very much. Um, we look forward to seeing you next month.
Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Okay. So with that, I will move on to item five in our agenda, which is document 375832 Appleton Street. Um, and if, uh, if the applicant could please introduce herself and tell us what she is uh, looking to do. Hi, uh, thank you for having me and hearing my um, request. I am a new homeowner at 32 Appleton Street in the Heights, and I'm a licensed massage therapist. And I uh, was previously living in Woburn and practicing out of my home there with a solo establishment license through the city and the state and everything. And I'm just hoping to do the same thing at my home now in Arlington. Okay. Um, I will bring up the application here. Um, so there are two applications that were filed. There was an initial application, which is an application for a special permit. Um, and then that was well, and a, the advertisement went out as a request for a special permit. Um, and then there was a follow-up application as a request for a variance. Um, right, because when I when I initially called the zoning board to, to ask what I needed to do in order to get permission to, to practice, I was told to fill out the first application. Yeah. And then just today was corrected and told to fill out the other one. Okay. Um, So the essentially the issue at hand. So this would be a request for home occupancy. Uh, excuse me, a home occupation, um, right? Which falls under the in the zoning board of appeals is something um, that requires the action of the board. Uh, there was there's been some question back and forth between myself and um, the. Uh, um, excuse me, uh, Mr. Champa, who is the Director of Inspectional Services um, in regards to the use that is being requested um, by the zone, by the, um, oops, the, ah, sorry, I'm just, what's going on here? Oh, um, Um, under the zoning bylaw, there are specific things that are eligible for home occupation. No, oh, of course, it's my, it is now crashed. Okay. Um, so home occupation does not allow things that, which are categorized as a, um, Oh, bigger part, and I just need to reopen this because I need. I do want to make sure I read this correctly into the record. Okay, so home occupation is an accessory use which is carried on entirely within a dwelling unit and is incidental and subordinate to the dwelling use, which does not include retail sale of merchandise on the premises, nor alter the residential character of the lot or building as regulated under Section 591. Home occupation shall not include personal service establishment uses, office, business, or professional uses, commercial stables or kennels, the teaching of more or the teaching of more than three pupils simultaneously and in the case of music instruction teaching of more than one pupil at a time um and then for here the question is the personal establishment uses um which is in our the personal service establishments are retail establishments primarily engaged in providing individual services generally related to personal needs but 
such as, but not limited to, a barbershop, hair salon, nail salon, drop-off, pickup, dry cleaning business, or self-service laundry tailor or shoe repair shop. Um, and a office uses. Um, so office business or professional uh, building or portion of building used to provide services to customers or clientele, such as an insurance agency, real estate office, service that involves some specialized skill or knowledge typically obtained through advanced education and training, such as an attorney or architect. The term office, business, or professional shall not include medical offices for a physician, dentist, or other healthcare professionals. So an office, medical, or clinic is a building, buildings containing offices, facilities, providing medical, dental, psychiatric, and related health care services for outpatients only. Um, office medical or clinical shall not include a hospital. So I had asked the building inspector to clarify where the town considers massage because the word massage does not appear in our zoning bylaws. Um, and he had responded that massage has historically been classified as a personal service unless the applicant has advanced training and certification that allows them to provide services that propose to treat medical conditions. So the, the, the primary issue before the board is if this is a is personal service uh, use, then it is not an allowed use for a home occupation. Um, and as such, the, and under state law, the board is not allowed to grant a variance for use. Um, and so the board would not be allowed to, um, to grant a variance to allow a personal, uh, a personal, um, service to be used as a home occupation. Um, however, if the, if, if that, that, based on the determination of the um, of the zoning enforcement official. Um, and so the question then becomes, does the board agree with that determination? Um, and if it does not, is the board able to act upon that or does the board need to um, defer back to the, the zoning official and then um, proceed with a uh, an appeal of the decision of the building inspector. So um, to unfortunately, this is kind of a little bit of a muddy quandary for the board. Um, I would like, I, I know a lot, some of this information came in rather late. So I do want to just sort of run this through with the board, see where people sort of fall on this question. Um, primarily where the, the zoning official has made a determination that he typically, that typically Massage is considered a personal service unless there is specific advanced training. And I guess that, let me go ahead and actually ask that question of Ms. Francis, um, sort of the, the nature of her training and whether it is more towards uh, just sort of general massage or massage as a, as a, as a therapy for medical condition. Um, I, <clears throat> I, I, see a variety of clients typically and I do often treat people I mean I don't know what the classification would be I often treat people who are recovering from injuries and you know knee replacement surgeries and that kind of thing I have a certification in pre and postnatal massage as well as a technique called positional release which is great for chronic pain such as things like sciatica and fibromyalgia um and other nerve disorders, Guillain-Barre syndrome, things like that. Okay. Right, thank you. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, just as a question in what you've just told us, Ms. Francis, uh, was has that information ever been shared with the uh, building inspector? With Mr. Chomper? I'm sorry, was, was that a question uh, for me? Yeah, it was. I, I'm trying oh, to... Okay. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out what he knew knows as yeah. compared to what we know. I don't I don't think there was any questions of that nature in the application so I don't think he would have that information that I just provided. So, I mean Mr. Chairman, let me just say that for what I understand Mr. Champa to have done is to sort of set forth the rule, but as far as I know he hasn't actually applied the rule in this case and 
you know, really doesn't have the information before him, uh, even that we have, which was really only about 30 seconds worth. Uh, and there's lots of, there's potentially a lot of information there that needs to be considered that probably we shouldn't be considering in the first instance here, uh, but that Mr. Champa should be considering before he makes a uh, ruling about how the traditional interpretation of this provision applies in this particular case. Mr. Chairman? Mr. DuPont. So I agree with what Mr. Hanlon just said. And would you mind reading again the language that you just quoted with regard to massage being a part of medical treatment? Sure. That is the email from the building inspector uh, where he says, massage has historically been classified as a personal service unless the applicant has advanced training and certification that allows them to provide services that propose to treat medical conditions. So I, I just think that that underscores Mr. Hanlon's point that that's something that Ms. Francis uh, should probably discuss with Mr. Champa to see how that might affect any determination that he would make. Indeed, I, I would ask uh, Ms. Francis, are you aware of any? I, I, I know that you're you're a licensed professional by the, um, you know, the Division of Occupational Licensure in the mm. Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, are you aware of any other sort of certification processes that would be more towards, uh, you know, sort of more towards sort of a, a medical or sort of as, as is alluded to by the building inspector, is, does the Commonwealth have such a delineation? Um, as far as I know, I mean, there are various kinds of additional certifications that you can get, such as I mentioned, pre and postnatal and the positional release. Um, and there are a slew of those, but there's, okay. as far as I know, there's not a, any different kind of licensure. It would just be a, an additional workshop or certification that you could acquire. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Okay. So if the if this was a use that was definitely allowed under home occupation, um, a home occupation is allowed as an accessory use in the R2 to in, in, in oops, sorry, I'm in the business section. Let me go back to R2. So I want to make sure that we are covering ourselves here. Um, office uses, accessory, home occupation notes, requires a special permit if home occupation serves customers or pupils on the premises, section 591. Um, so quickly finding 591. So under 591, in any residential district, a home occupation is permitted if all the following conditions are met. No non-resident shall be employed therein. Not more than 25% of the existing GFA of the dwelling unit in the principal building, not to exceed 600 square feet, is devoted to the home occupation. And no stock and trade commodities or products shall occupy space beyond those limits. There should be no display of goods or wares visible from the street. All advertising devices visible from off the lot are specifically prohibited. The buildings or premises occupied shall not have a detrimental impact on the neighborhood due to exterior appearance, emissions of odor, gas, smoke, dust, noise, etc. cetera. Um, and you shall not become objectionable or detrimental to any residential use. Any such building shall include no feature of design nor customary, not customary in buildings of residential use where permitted or allowed by special permit in the use regulations, a physician may operate an office on the physician's residence with up to one non-resident employee. Um, so the, if the use, if the use was clearly allowed as a home occupation use, the board uh, would be able to approve um, 
the use uh, to have an employee, to, uh, excuse me, for the occupant to have people in the in the home for the purpose of the use. Um, but to the points raised by uh, Mr. Hanlon and Mr. Dupont, um, it there there is still a question about whether how to exactly to apply this use, um, and is not something that the board can um, can readily determine. And it's something I think that, to, to Mr. Hanlon's point, is probably best worked out between Ms. Francis and the building inspector. Um, we can certainly. Um, move to continue on this um, to a date certain, but I know that we do have someone present who has um, submitted a comment to this application. Um, and so I would like to go ahead and, and take public comment, um, specifically as it relates to whether this uh, uh, home occupation use, how it would impact the community and, and not specifically on the use underlying it. Um, so with that, um, I will now open the meeting for public comment. Public questions, the comments are taken as they relate to the matter at hand. It should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing its decision. Members of the public will be granted time to ask questions and make comments. Uh, members of the public who wish to speak should digitally raise their hand using the button on, I can never remember, that's these are the partition tab, uh, the reactions tab now. Um, in the Zoom application, those calling by phone, please dial star nine to indicate you'd like to speak. You'll be called upon by the meeting host, asked to give your name and address given time for your questions and comments. All questions are to be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly. Um, so with that, um, we have uh, Mara Georgie. Yeah, close enough. Um, I live at 11 Acton Street, and um, I know for everybody on the zoning board, you know that that is directly across the street from, um, uh, what do they call themselves, Arlington Heights Nursery School. So my concern is we are already overburdened by people who are asked to park elsewhere and do not. So yeah. I saw on Ms. Francis' application that there is space in my uh, driveway, I would like to know, um, is there a way that we can, is there an enforcement mechanism for that? And that the other thing would be that she just would not put her car out in the street. Um, it's, you know, we, we, we watch middle school kids nearly get run over on a daily basis. Thank you for that. Uh, Ms. Mm -hmm. Francis, what would be your intention for uh, customer parking? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, we have, I don't know if you're familiar, Mara, with the with the property 32 Appleton Street, but it's a very long driveway. We there's yeah, I and I would I would never have more than one client at a time. And there would they I would not have to move my car onto the street and they could easily park in the driveway behind my car because I would not need to leave while I had a client there. Right. Okay, so um that sounds like good intention. Um, I don't know what the board has the ability to do or not do, but I just wanted to, to put that out there. So thank you for allowing me to speak. You're very welcome. Are there others who wish to speak to this application? Seeing none, I'm going to go ahead and close public comment uh, for this specific hearing. Um, so with that, Ms. Francis, would you be amenable to um, us proposing a continuance to um, allow you to try to discuss further with the special services department and, and see if we can find a workaround to the, the, the question of what the use, what the appropriate use should be? Sure. So how, what would the, the procedure be? I would reach out to that person and, and then we would just get back on the schedule for next month or? Um, so what we would do, we would uh, propose continuance to a date certain, which would be September 26th. Um, and then I would ask you to get in touch with Ms. Ralston, um, who's the zoning administrator. She can put you directly in touch with um, the building inspector. She'll be very familiar with, with what exactly it is that needs to be discussed between the two of you. 
Um, and so she can help to sort of uh, facilitate the the start of that discussion. And then um, hope that we'll get hopefully something uh, more firm back from the building inspector as to you know exactly what the determination is and what the board needs to determine. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I was wondering if if we could, I'd like to be a little bit more clear on, on one thing. Uh, the record doesn't say yet whether Ms. Francis is proposing to have any uh, non-resident uh, employee on the on the property. So you're shaking your head. Um, one no. thing that yeah, it was. Sorry, go ahead. It's okay. One thing I, uh, it's not clear to me that if the building inspector were to decide that this is a permitted use, whether there's anything more that needs to be done on our side. Uh, this is indicated in, in the R2, if this is a home occupation, it's indicated as yes. Uh, and if there's no employee, uh, there isn't a need for a special permit. And so I guess one question that we we will need to have is is whether or not there's any uh, there's any further role for this if if Mr. Champa agrees with Ms. Francis. If not, Obviously, she can appeal the decision to us, uh, and we can deal with it in that context. But I'm not sure what else there is for us to do beside that. So under the use table for residential, um, home occupation is listed as an accessory use. Oops, I'm in the wrong place here. Um, and it does note it does note requires a special permit if home occupation serves customers or pupils on the premises. See section 591. Okay. Um, that. So it isn't the employee only. That's not the, that's not the. No. Um, but what, okay. But it also, I'm also a little confused because 591, um, makes no statement about having it has a statement about non non-resident employees but it has no statement about uh students or uh right. customers which is the source of my confusion as well okay well we i'm sure we'll have time to figure this out before the end yeah. of september but uh it it, it is a question Okay. Um, then with that, I would uh, seek a motion to continue uh, the hearing for 32 Appleton Street to a date certain of Tuesday, September 26th at 7.30 p.m. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. So moved. Second, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. So this is a, a vote of the board to continue the special the, uh, the hearing for 32 Appleton Street uh, to a date certain of Tuesday, September 26th at 7.30 p.m. Um, vote of the board, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Uh, Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. And the chair votes aye. We are continued on 32 Appleton Street. Thank you so much to the applicant for appearing um, and to the neighbors who appeared on behalf of this hearing. Thank you. With that, back to my agenda, brings up uh, docket 37615 uh, Mystic Lake Drive. Um, if I could ask the applicant to introduce themselves and uh, make their presentation to the board. Yes. Uh, good evening, uh, folks. Uh, Robert Anessi, counsel for the applicant. I'm accompanied this evening by William Mahoney, who is the developer, and John Barrows, who is the PE. Uh, John was the uh, individual who handled the conservation hearings uh, with respect to uh, the permission we needed to get from conservation. The property itself is in an R2 zone. Uh, I must admit that I made a mistake uh, on the dimensional form uh, when I indicated that the historical use was as a two-family. 
historical use was as a single family, not a two family. Uh, I have submitted corrected dimensional forms and a corrected uh, special permit app uh, fixing that. Okay. Uh, Is it but, just that one line that you corrected? Uh, that's all I corrected. Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, with respect to the property itself, the property has been a challenging site, particularly with respect to conservation issues. The Conservation Commission uh, did have jurisdiction because the property uh, was in fact uh, uh, subject to flooding in, in a riverfront area. But again, the property has been in an R2 zone. What we're proposing to do, and what the Conservation Commission decision indicated, which I sent to the board as part of my submission, is that we uh, propose to demolish the existing single-family house and construct a two-family house. Now, the reason we're before the zoning board has nothing to do with conservation issues. The reason we're before the zoning board has to do with a second curb cut. Uh, we need a second curb cut to accommodate the construction which we're, uh, we're proposing for the site. Uh, that second curb cut, uh, Christian, is shown on the uh, plan submitted, the utility site plan uh, that uh, we submitted with our application. Uh, and that uh, plan shows the, uh, the two curb cuts. They're nine feet wide. Uh, by the way, the existing curb cut would be relocated and the new curb cut would be constructed. You pose questions to me, uh, uh, Christian, uh, that I had to answer for you uh, with respect to uh, our proposal. And one of the questions you posed was the deed on the property indicated that there was a 15 foot uh, prohibition uh, with respect to getting into the front yard. Uh, that was a deed restriction that was put on the property more than 50 years ago. The difficulty for my client is we're dealing with registered land. And when you're dealing with registered land, the only way you can get that kind of a defunct deed restriction off is by going ahead and filing a petition with the land court, which I did. Uh, the land court then issued an order eliminating that 15 foot uh, uh, issue. One of the things that we needed to uh, establish uh, with respect to our plans was how to deal with the setback. And the way we dealt with that, is, again, is shown on that plan plan, uh, that, that plot plan, university uh, uh, utility site plan, way at the top on the left. It shows the house. Would it be helpful for me to go ahead and share that? Yes, would you do that please? Absolutely. That's right up there on the left-hand side. Those are the lots that we looked at for the purpose of determining the uh, average setback requirement. Uh, if you have questions on that, once I finish my presentation, Mr. Mahoney can uh, respond to those questions. Uh, with respect to the, the plans, uh, again, no one should be surprised that we're proposing to construct a two-family dwelling in a two in a R2 zone. That's exactly what we're proposing to do. And if you visit the neighborhood, you're going to see that there are many two-family homes in that zone, as there would be in an R2 zone. The uh, hearings before the Conservation Commission went on for a number of uh, meetings, and the conservation uh, voted unanimously uh, to grant relief to my client. Now, I know issues have been raised uh, by others with respect to uh, conservation matters. Again, we're not before you on conservation issues. Uh, one section of the bylaw uh, was cited uh, with respect to uh, a conservation issue, but I believe if that becomes an issue for any member of the board, uh, I can have Mr. Barrows respond to that if it becomes necessary. But again, I would like to see the hearing focus on the second curb cut. Now, 
with respect to the second curb cut, we need relief under section 6.1.10. And that basically is the zoning provision that uh, allows a second uh, curb cut in a second driveway. Uh, we need to demonstrate certain things to be entitled to that. And among those things that we need to demonstrate, we need to show that uh, there will not be undue congestion with respect to uh, the uh, second driveway, uh, no, uh, uh, no safety issues. And one of the issues that you raised with me, Christian, was the distance of the uh, proposed curb cut to the corner. Uh, the uh, we believe that uh, I believe that it is 50 plus feet to the corner. Uh, that's not uh, uh, a response that I gave you because, quite frankly, uh, I had not heard from the engineer in time to get that response to you. But we believe that uh, the distance is uh, approximately 50 feet, which is plenty of room with regard to anyone making that turn at the corner uh, to have the uh, that uh, second curb kite, proposed curb kite, in sight when they make that turn. So we don't think there's going to be a safety issue at all uh, with respect to the second curb kite. I'm going to say this too about the master plan. Uh, we know that the master plan encourages uh, more living units in town not just the master plan, but some of the zoning am amendments that have occurred uh, in the last year or two at town meeting. This is an opportunity to have a second unit, okay? A second living unit in the town, which again, I think uh, goes along with the focus and the intent of the master plan. With respect to the zoning aspect of the matter, uh, we believe that we satisfy <clears throat> the zoning requirements. Uh, we don't believe that we are going to be in violation of any of the zoning requirements uh, by adding the second uh, uh, curb cut. And indeed, section 6.1.10 uh, uh, would not allow us to get relief if, in fact, uh, we were going to be in violation. So we do not believe... Uh, uh, we would be in violation. I had the engineer prepare the dimensional form uh, with respect to the plans, uh, with respect to uh, accuracy. So we are here before you this evening, not for conservation purposes. Uh, the, some of the folks who may speak tonight have already had their innings, quite frankly, with conservation, uh, been heard before conservation, Conservation took everything into account, and conservation, as I say, voted unanimously to allow the construction with certain limitations. Uh, those limitations are, again, set forth within the, the substance of the Conservation Commission decision, which I recorded at the Registry of Deeds back in May. Uh, the uh, Again, uh, we're asking you folks to render a decision uh, with respect to the zoning aspects of this matter. Uh, with that, if you have any questions for me, uh, please direct them to me. And if you have any questions for either Mr. Mahoney or Mr. Barrows, uh, you can direct them to them as well. They're both on the Zoom. Thank you very much. Um, Quickly scroll through the the set here. So, as we've been looking at, this is the the set utility plan with the building here. Um, the existing property has a garage in approximately this location with a curb cut, very similar location to this one. Um, so, this would be a new curb cut for a second driveway. This curb cut is proposed to be relocated um, for the notation here on the plan. Um, and then this is the the edge of the Mystic River um, and the dimensions off the edge there. Um, that's not what I meant to do. Uh, that's the square footage of the different floor levels, I believe. Uh, so this is um, 
the existing usable open space and landscape space and as proposed. So this is the side, this side here is the, the front for these two images. Um, so this will be the front elevation. The house is viewed from um, Mystic, Mystic Lakes uh, Drive. Um, the two side elevations. Uh, this would be the facing the abutting neighbor to the left. This is the elevation that would face uh, Miss Valley Parkway. Uh, and then the rear elevation, which would also technically uh, front onto Mystic Valley Parkway. Structural, this is the basement level plan. I uh, you know that it has, does have egress windows um, to either side. Um, uh, Mr. Nancy, did the egress windows, do they require a, a pit on the exterior to access them? Uh, Bill? Yes, they do. Can you hear me? I can, yes. Yes, they do. And one thing I would like to mention as well, um, the whole reason for the two driveways was to stay out of the flood zone, which is a requirement for the whole, the entire thing is out of the flood zone, which was okay. a big thing with conservation. I just wanted to mention that's the reason for the two driveways and the request for the curb cut. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, the second floor is... Um, and then I believe this is the attic floor. Now the roof plans, structural, structural, structural. <clears throat> the fire separations, that's the section through, <clears throat> approximate grade. Um, and then the height of the house being 34, 10 and a quarter, which is less than the Maximum of 35. And then just some construction details. And then going back again to the to the site plan. Um, so on the plan, I believe that this here is the bump outs that are at the first floor level. They're the the box. Bays, is that correct? That's correct. I was planning on putting it on a fireplace outside the house. Mr. Mahoney, can you comment on that? Yes, I oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I thought you I did I did uh oh comment. sorry. It's okay. Um yeah, those are gonna be fireplaces. A little uh it's it's off the ground, it's about two feet from three feet from the ground, and it's just about 18 inches deep. Or give or give or take about four feet wide, and there's a fireplace in there. Oh, okay. And then the the window wells are not shown here for the basement, but are they past the end of the driveways? Correct. Yep, they're right of right about right about the end. Yeah. The other the other thing that um that I think you guys have not on this one um it shows them shows them on there. I don't I don't know. I know I just saw them on something, but uh, I don't, yeah, they're, they're definitely past the driveways. Yes, can, they're okay. several feet past. Okay. So the request that's being made is in regards to section uh, 6110, which is location of parking spaces. So 6110A, parking in residential districts. Um, do you see the zoning bylaw now or do you still see the, the plan? Excuse me. Sorry. I'm sorry, Mr. Handler, what do you see? The zoning bylaw. You see the bylaw. Okay. So uh so for single family to the second paragraph, uh not more than one driveway shall be permitted unless there's a finding by the special permit granting authority for the development that a second driveway or a driveway that makes more than one intersection with a street may be added in a manner that avoids an undue concentration of population allows adequate provision of transportation and conserves the value of land and buildings in the vicinity. In no case may a second driveway for a single family, two family duplex or three family dwelling violate any other dimensional or density regulations for the district in which it is located. 
uh, and then no more than two driveways are permitted. Um, and then in that first paragraph under parking in residential districts, um, so no parking shall not be permitted in the area between the front lot line and the minimum front setback, except on a driveway not exceeding 20 feet in width, leading to required parking spaces. Off-state parking is permitted in the side yard, in the rear yard on a paved driveway, or in the case of a corner lot, la, 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 la. number two in an attached garage, number three within the foundation of a dwelling. Any driveway leading to off-street parking on a lot cannot exceed 15% downward slope. Uh, space designed for parking within an existing garage is determined to meet the requirements. Side yards used for parking shall have a vegetated buffer when abutting a lot used for residential pur purposes to minimize visual impacts. So returning to the plan here, I know that there was a revised plan that was provided that indicated that there would be some sort of uh, planting in these areas um, on the outside of the um, proposed parking. Um, I did want to ask the applicant how they were going to be addressing uh, providing a vegetated buffer when the distance to the property line is so tight uh, in regards to the parking space here to the left side of the property. I was going to try and put a hedge there as to the best of my ability. I, I, I mean, I suppose I could probably squeeze a few more inches to the right. I, again, I could take off the fireplace if you guys wanted. I could probably put those inside the building and then I'd have a few extra feet to push that over. I, I think I think we put three feet on that, but, I, you know, I'd have to talk to conservation. I can't imagine they'd have a big, you know, difference to move that in a foot or so to uh, to accommodate that. Okay. I don't know if you guys could make that a requirement. I'm happy to do it. It looks like it's pretty close over there, and I can certainly understand that. And the questions certainly valid. And I was also a little concerned that the proposed curb cut seems to be offset from the driveway, especially with the location of the electrical box right there on the curb. Um, so it would seem that having the. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say having the driveway a little bit closer to the house would help to align the the curb cut with the driveway and to you know provide a little bit more space around the that electrical box. Yeah, like I said, I have no issues trying to pull that a little closer. Like if it meant getting rid of the fireplace, I'm certainly willing to do that. I'd probably have to mm -hmm. if you guys say give me a condition, I'd I'd probably have to run it by conservation, but I can't imagine they'd have a big problem if I cut that and just push it to the right of foot or to whatever you guys think it to, is necessary, you certainly be willing to do that. Okay. And the only other question I have, um, so there was a, a question that had come in, uh, a couple questions that had come from um, residents in regards to section 5.7 of the zoning bylaw, okay. um, which I will go ahead and scroll back up to, Oop, too far. Um, <clears throat> and which is, come on. Oops, I went too far again. 5.7 floodplain district. Um, so just wanted to ask if the question of whether this property is located within the floodplain district and whether um, the property is in compliance with the requirements of this section of the zoning bylaw. Uh, uh, question, I'm going to let John Barrows answer that. But uh, in your opening comments, you made a statement uh, <clears throat> that this comment came in from a resident. Mm -hmm. He's not a resident, okay? I want that to be clear for the record. He is not a resident. Uh, he appears frequently on zoning hearings and ARB hearings, but he is not a resident. All right, John, would you address that issue, please? I'd be happy to. Uh, good evening. Um, so just to give you a little background on um, you know, how uh, site came about um, with the developer. Um, the first thing we did uh, when we uh, started on the project was to um, you know, have a survey done with elevations, uh, determined what the flood uh, plain or the 100 year flood elevation was, we applied to, to FEMA to, re to um, receive a LOMA, uh, which is a letter of math amendment, as you probably know, um, and because they do a broad stroke on their maps that show, you know, a large area. So we, we defined the the flood uh, elevation, 
And um, the developer worked with that line or the elevation and uh, and the Conservation Commission. And then we brought everything within that elevation, which is 7.1. Um, so you know, we went back and forth a number of meetings with the uh, Conservation Commission. Make sure that you know all of all of the you know different parts of the project, uh, the structures really were inside the um, flood flood um, 100 year flood elevation, um, which also designates the limit of the floodway as well. Um, so we have you know designed the site to fall within um, uh, you know the up I should say outside of the flood uh, hazard areas. Okay. So I would just note that the this section of the bylaw, as as stated by Mr. Nessie, is not under under is not being requested that the board review this section of the bylaw. Yes. Um, I only mentioned it because it it was referenced in a letter to the board. I understand. Yes. Um, I agree and, with this. And that the only matter that is before the board this evening is uh, the the matter of the second driveway. Um, and if the board should be um, Taking a vote this evening on this application, it might be worthwhile for the board to consider a condition noting that the board um, has not made any determinations in regard to section 5.7. Um, just to, just to, as a something to consider um, going forward with this. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. So I take it if if that turns out to be what happens. Uh, the applicant would be proceeding at its risk. We, uh, the building inspector, as far as I know, has not made a determination on on this and could do whatever he chose to do. That, but they would certainly they would simply not have an appointment uh, a permit that authorized anything under that section of the bylaw. Is that correct? So the that section of the bylaw, I believe, does provide that the the board is able to make us to. Uh, provide a special permit in certain cases. Um, and so I just would want it to be clear that the board is not, isn't making no determinations in regards to any special permits that might relate to uh, compliance with section 5.7. And that's because we're asked not to. So if Mr. Champa's suddenly got to be in his bonnet about that section, the applicant would be on his own. Is that correct? The, certainly, and the applicant could apply again to the Zoning Board of Appeals for a specific determination in regards to that section. This was Thank all you. vetted with Mr. Chip. Uh, okay. Plans were, yeah. Perfect. Are there questions from the board for the applicant? I do not see any questions from the board. Um, uh, so we'll now open the meeting for public comment. As said before, public questions and comments are taken as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Members of the public are granted time to ask questions and make comments. Those who wish to speak <clears throat> should digitally raise their hand using the button on the <clears throat> participant tab. Uh, no, sorry, it's not on the participant tab. It's on the reactions tab. Um, in the Zoom application, those calling in by phone, please dial star nine to indicate you'd like to speak. You'll be called upon by the host to ask to give your name and address, given time for your questions and comments. All questions will be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly. Um, so with that, uh, the, the first name on the list is uh, Barbara Hindley. Yes, thank you very much. Um, if you could uh, give your name and address of the record, please. Barbara Hindley, 6 Mystic Lake Drive, directly across from 5 Mystic Lake Drive. I'm a person who believes that affordable housing is very important, <laughs> but this is not affordable housing, first of all. Secondly, Robert Aness um, glossed over the fact <laughs> that he characterized the property as a two-family in the applications and it has been i have lived here for 34 years and it has always been a one family home and i know that he apologized and that's lovely um but i don't i think that that is cause for re-examining the entire process um also i pay for flood insurance every year
charge flood insurance to these new uh, occupants, and I don't understand why that would be the case. I've paid flood, flood insurance for 34 years, and I paid it this year. Um, to be totally honest with you, it's very intimidating for me to speak to a group of men um, I'm a single woman, a widow living across the street, and it's frightening to me to uh, to speak out in this way. Um, but I think that Arlington is making a huge mistake by tearing down perfectly fine single family homes and replacing them with <laughs> with high. I mean, you know that these condos are going to sell for more than a million dollars. That is not affordable housing. And the fact that Chapa was was quoted in any aspect of this case is absolutely ridiculous. Chapa is for affordable housing, not this kind of housing. And I'm frightened to say this because I know the con contractor is here and his lawyer is here and I'm right across the street. And it's it's frightening for me to say this. So I will stop there. Well, thank you very much for coming before us this evening. Um, the comments of all the neighbors are very important to the board and our determination of the proceedings. We appreciate your coming out to this evening. Um, with that, I'll move on to the, the next on the list, uh, which is uh, Dave DiLorenzo. Hi, good evening. Um, thanks for good evening. to listen. Um, um, Just name an address for the record, please. Dave DiLorenzo and Charlie O'Connell were uh, butters directly across the street at 10 Mystic Lake Drive. Um, we, um, um, just as a process question, submitted a letter at 8.45 this morning that didn't show up in the docket. Is it, is it, can I assume that it was received and reviewed by zoning board members or um, would it be necessary to read the letter into? If, if you wouldn't mind reading it in, um, that would be appreciated. Okay, I can paraphrase it in. Uh, I don't want to take people's time unnecessarily, but I, I, I do first want to then say that we strongly endorse um, uh, Barbara Henley's comments. Um, uh, we um, appreciate everything that she had to say and uh, see ourselves as aligned with her concerns. Um, so, you know, we also, the, the letter um, starts by saying that we appreciate the um, alterations that the developer has made, um, intended to decrease the amount of impermeable surface area of the new pr proposed construction to satisfy the concerns of the Conservation Commission. And we also understand that while the existing structure is a single family residence, the neighborhood is zoned for two family residences, and we support the, the need for additional housing in Arlington, particularly affordable housing. And if this project were to provide that within the same footprint, we would be in favor of it. Um, that said, we don't believe that the five Mystic Lake Drive property is well suited for expansion of its existing footprint or for conversion to a two family residence due to its constrained location overlapping a designated floodplain and floodway. Um, and we understand that some of these issues have been brought up before, but this is, um, but they haven't been addressed to the satisfaction of the abutters by the Conservation Commission, and this is the forum that we have. So I appreciate your uh, patience and tolerance. Um, I'll try and keep the comments regarding those aspects of our concerns brief. Um, <clears throat> so um, we hope that generally this over, you know, this this broad concern and specific concerns, which I'll go into, can take, be taken into consideration tonight. So first, you know, just back to the quickly the issue of how the the application for this uh, variance was was presented as uh, a initially a, a two family. The house was uh, the property was referred to uh, as a, a two family property. It was it was, and I do appreciate the correction, but it was referred to consistently and in multiple locations as a two family residence. And beyond that. I think it's important to note that there is language supporting that, which, um, which um, so the effect that the um, that the um, uh, proposal would would modify the existing building, retaining its main characteristics and allowing continued use of the building as a two-family residential structure. So, 
um, retaining its main characteristics seems wholly false. Um, not at all, uh, not at all um, correct and not addressed by the correction. Um, specifically, the proposal would change the design from that of a 1929 Arlington single family to a contemporary side-by-side -side condo with four levels of livable space, nearly doubling the gross floor area from 2,250 to 4,150 square feet and nearly tripling the livable square footage from 1,776 square feet to 4,974. That's a substantial change. It is, it is not a small change, it's a substantial change. That's concern number one. <clears throat> um, concern number two was about the, um, the floodway designation, and I'll leave that aside for now. Um, but but um, the floodplain, I believe, has not been changed by the Conservation Commission. And the letter of map amendment that was received should not have changed that because the it only applied to the structure and not the lot. And so I think that, and this and I I in my letter referred to the zoning bylaw 5.7.5B. And I am a resident. I'm not someone from out of town. Um, just to correct that that prior comment. But 5.75 what excuse me, 5.7.5B. Um According to that, development to an existing dwelling in the floodplain district are permitted, provided that any expansion is limited to, uh, quote, a maximum of 15% of the lot coverage existing when this section is enacted, provided that such expansions conform to this section five, do not constitute substantial improvement of a structure. Substantial improvement means any repair, reconstruction, or improvement of the structure, the cost of which exceeds 50% of the actual cash value of the structure. Now, the developer's proposal would violate that provision, both by expanding well beyond 15% of the existing lot coverage and the construction of a building that would cost undoubtedly well more than 50% of the cash value of the existing structure. Um, and again, while the above referenced a letter of map amendment from FEMA would exempt the future homeowners from the need to carry flood insurance. It does not apply to the entirety of the lot, nor does it release the developer from the obligation to comply with local zoning laws. Um, the next concern is a little bit different. Um, it was noted during the Conservation Commission hearing by someone who appeared very well versed in Arlington zoning bylaws that the existing setback from the road would no longer be sufficient if the footprint of the building were to change. Um, I tried to wrap my head around the setback aspect of the bylaws and couldn't figure it out, but I'm not fluent in that, but I'm hoping that the zoning board can just consider that generally um, during your um, evaluation of the proposal in general. And then finally, and um, I say this with some reluctance, I don't mean to um, directly um, impugn the motives of the, de of the developer, but it's just... Um, come up as a concern for um, ourselves and for uh, other neighbors, but the developer has on multiple occasions brought heavy machinery and dumpsters on site without retaining a permit, apparently without penalty. And it it's led to concerns by us and other abutters that other obligations and agreements with the town, which the developer has consented to, will not be complied with. Um, we understand that things come up, but obtaining basic the permits for um, these operations would seem like a, a fundamental prerequisite of doing any of the work that needs to be done. So the fact that the first, very first permit that was was obtained was for a dumpster that appeared a few days ago, um, and um, and none of the work that had been done prior uh, was permitted is a concern that I think uh, warrants consideration by the zoning board. Um, that's it. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Um, before I move on to the to the next um, uh, the next person who has their hand raised, I would like to remind the board, uh, excuse me, remind the public that the, the issue before the board is the approval of a second driveway for this property, um, the appropriateness of the the structure, compliance with um, 
sections of the bylaw that have to do with inland waterways or with uh, with floodways, um, issues about approval by the Conservation Commission. Those are things that this board has no jurisdiction over at this time. Um, the only thing that is before us is the question of the second driveway. Um, and that is um, uh, we would ask that uh, ask the people who are speaking before the before the board, if they could try to limit their comments uh, to assist the board in making its determination in regards to that question, uh, we would greatly appreciate it. Uh, with that, uh, the next hand raised is uh, Joanne Preston. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, can I speak now? Yes, please. Name and address for the okay. record. Um, Hi, everyone. I'm Joanne Preston. Um, I'm a resident of Arlington. And as a matter of fact, I'm a resident of Mystic Lake Drive. Um, I've submitted some remarks that came out of some discussions I've had with um, some of the people living on Mystic Lake Drive. But um, I would just like to add them for the record. Um, one is that the second driveway violates the town public tree bylaws as it is too close to a street tree and moving the proposed second driveway would locate it into the regulatory floodways. So um, perhaps I haven't been to many of your meetings, so you may know that um, the distance that a driveway has to be from a street tree is determined by something called the DBH, which is the diameter breast height. Um, a number of years ago, there, there was a DBH assigned to this tree, but trees grow. I've been down there and measured it myself. It's, um, and by using that, they determine how, how much space there should be between the tree and the curb cut. And from what I have seen from the developer that they do not meet this requirement. Um, shall I continue with my... Um, Please. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I don't believe, and it's been noted before, that this plan is not in compliance with bylaw 6.1.10 which side laws, yards are used for parking, shall have a vegetated buffer, which abutting a lot used for residential purposes and so on. Now, I know you've discussed that and there was some talk about, okay, we'll talk to the Conservation Commission, but I didn't hear anything about exactly a commitment. I have the same concerns as the previous speaker a commitment that it would be done. And I would think if you were found no other problem in the second driveway, you would have to get a written commitment to make sure that it got done. Um, <clears throat> also, I wanna talk about safety, which in terms of flooding, <clears throat> frequently there is flooding on Mystic Valley Parkway to the extent that the parkway is closed. Um, and much of that flooding is around the Mystic Lake Drive entrance. Um, just recently with constant rains, um, they closed Mystic Valley Parkway at Mystic Lake Drive and the flooding extended to the proposed second driveway site. Um, this was told to me by our first speaker who lives at six Mystic Lake Drive and observed it. And I went down and observed it also. As climate change continues, we expect even greater flooding on lower Mystic Lake Drive. Um, and that's not only a concern for the residents, but it, for but the people who are gonna buy these condominiums, remember that the developer is leaving and everything has to be suitable for them. Um, I would also like to talk about this. This has to do with safety. The other thing about safety, it may be the driveway is now 50 feet, but it's gonna to have to move from 
Mystic Valley Parkway turn, but it's not a right angle turn. It's actually, if you look at the map, it's a very sharp turn to the right. There are many small children within the abutters of that neighborhood. And I don't think that a person turning off of Mystic Valley Parkway is um, making that sharp turn is going to have be able to see children riding their bikes and so on. Um, let me just see if yes. there's one more. Um, second drive I do. And um, there, there are no legal two driveways on all of Mystic Lake Drive and the neighborhoods. So this is a very, un, it would be a very unusual event to have them there. I don't think people would be expecting them driving up and down Mystic Lake Drive, which is a safety issue. So um, that's, that's what I would like to have read into um, the minutes and for take into your consideration. And uh, the tree warden, of course, can be called on to do a recent assessment of the DVH of that large maple tree. But according to my calculations, the driveway is much too close. Thank you. Thank you. We did that on uh, the next uh, person on our list uh, is Don Seltzer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Don Seltzer, Harvest Circle Lincoln, and so recently a 50 year resident of Arlington. Um, I do intend to address the driveway issue, but I hope the chair will indulge me for 30 seconds to make a comment about the floodplain um, situation. Our uh, bylaws make a distinction between a floodplain and a floodway. The Conservation Commission does have the authority to make small changes to the floodplain, but they do not have the authority to alter the federal regulatory floodway. And there's also been new information that's come out since the spring Conservation Commission hearings. Uh, FEMA has issued a new preliminary um, flood map that does show that the proposed footprint of the new building does intrude upon the federal regulatory floodway. Uh, On to the question of a second driveway. Uh, a second driveway. Uh, I'd like to this. The driveways um, pose a pedestrian, pedestrian safety hazard um, because the, the applicant is only going with a very short setback in the front yard. Uh, we know that both tenants are going to have two cars each, as is usual practice, and there is not sufficient driveway length to provide for two of them. And um, each driveway is going to have, um, in the front yard, only 12 feet, nine inches, whereas the average car is going to be about five or even six feet longer than that. It's going to hang over the sidewalk um, almost into the street. Um, this is the situation right now with the existing house and the single driveway, as you can see behind me. And uh, having two driveways um, of only limited length is going to just exacerbate the problem by providing two pedestrian hazards where anyone walking on the sidewalk is going to have to walk out into the street. And as um, was this previous speaker, Ms. Preston noted, uh, it's going to be near cars coming off Mystic Valley Parkway and making the turn. So I suggest, I ask that the board consider um, whether the idea of having two sidewalk blocking driveways is a good idea for this location. Thank you. Thank you. Um. Next on uh, our list um, is Serena Bray. Hi, this is Serena Bray. I'm at 16 Mystic Lake Drive. 
and I am, um, I have two young kids and I observe them. Um, this, the, where the curb cut is or where the parking is gonna be, that parkway, people often speed around that parkway because they're coming out of a rotary situation. So the, the speed at which people come off the rotary during, um, you know, it, it really varies. It can be very calm or it can be very, very fast because people are speeding out of the rotary. And if you were to make that turn, it is a very sharp turn. Um, another issue I thought of is during the summer and the fall, uh, because we live near the Mystic Lakes, it's a huge amenity to the town, to many people outside of town. So many people often do park on Mystic Lake Drive because there's nothing, there's no signs that say no parking, residents only. It's literally open to everyone to park. So if you build a new building, which has six bedrooms and you only have a few spaces, when people have guests, when there's visitors during the summer and the fall, it really makes parking pretty hard because most of these houses, even though they're deemed um, residential, um, even for two, uh, residential R2, um, it's really hard to find parking in this in this one little street. Um, so overnight parking hasn't been improved. I know there's, you know, they're talking about allowing it, um, but that hasn't been in place. So I just feel like that's an issue. And then the other thing is that box that you pointed out, um, Mr. Klein, or uh, that box is actually, I think uh, the Department of Public Works often comes to check it because it runs the pumps to prevent sewage flooding or overflow when the Mystic Lake does tend to overflow. Um, so I've personally had all these houses around here have had um, sewage flooding or flooding issues. Um, this property I know, um, the previous owner, there is definitely, um, so that box should be protected and um, the location of that second curb cut is really close um, and probably should be, um, there should be more of a buffer. So thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate that. Um, next uh, speaker who hasn't spoken before um, would be uh, Steve Moore. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, I want to uh, I want to commend Ms. Hindley for being willing to come before the board and talk. I know it can be quite difficult, and it's. Um, it's but it's important, as I think she stated, and I'm I'm happy that she was willing to overcome her concerns and come and speak. Um, and I would like to, um, with with all with all respect, deserve respect to Mr. Anessi. I I I do want to raise an issue to do with the driveway's proximity to the intersection. I know that he feels that um, that 50 feet or, or the footage that is there now is is absolutely sufficient for the space between the uh, proposed curb cut and uh, the, the Mystic Lake uh, Drive. I'm not sure I'm not sure I'm saying the correct name, but that intersection. Um, I, I do believe the traffic moves at fairly high speed uh, on the Mystic Valley Parkway and cars will come around this corner quite quickly. And 50 feet in a normal condition uh, is not really sufficient here in this condition with cars moving quickly and a public street tree right there between the drug proposed curb cut and the corner. Um, the public street tree has to, is to be retained. It is not to be uh, damaged during construction or anything like that. And it is not a small tree. And I think that will impede any sight lines to someone coming out of such a curb cut at a driveway into the into the roadway. It's this is one of the problems of Mystic Valley Parkway where all the streets intersect. There's often residences close by and a similar case came up a couple of years back where someone was proposing the same thing, uh, another curb cut very close to the intersection where I believe there was a stop sign at the time and it just was kind of too tight. And I understand why this is being proposed. I don't I don't think the solution being proposed is an adequate solution. Uh, and I, I also applaud Ms. Preston's comments about um, the addition of this, this curb cut and driveway could certainly impact the second public street tree, which is right there and quite close. Um, and uh, although although it may be desirable for the developers to to you know, move around it and such. A lot of heavy equipment, a lot of construction, a complete teardown of what's going to be going on here 
is significant activity and will probably detrimentally impact these mature trees. Um, uh, one, one question, uh, the front setback requirement of the zone is is what currently, Mr. Chair, for this uh, property, front yard setback? The required front yard setback is 20 feet or the average setback uh, for the street. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair, because right now it looks to me like the, based on what I could interpret from the plans, which weren't, I don't know, it was like it's been copied too much. I couldn't tell how far it was exactly. It strikes me that this building is is too close, intrudes into the front yard setback. And since this is a property that has a road that wraps around it, it actually has, you know, a couple of cards, whether it's desired, you know, it's the way it is. And it strikes me that they're intruding into that. Also, Mr. Chair, if for you, I could ask the developer, what currently is the um, the tree situation of the town. I see no tree plan, um, and it certainly is required for this project since it's a teardown. Um, I don't know what trees are going to be taken as part of the process. And Mr. DiLorenzo had mentioned there's already been work done on the property. There's been heavy equipment there. I'm wondering what prep, what demo work has already occurred on this property that preceded the issuing of the building permit. Uh, Mr. Anessi, can you address the question as to where the where the permitting stands at the moment and has Bill, the applicant uh, spoken with the tree warden? Uh, Bill, can you jump can in certainly on that? answer any of those questions, folks? Um, as far as taking trees from the property, there's there's only one, and I think you guys can see it. Um, and I'm not taking any trees. I, I have had some, you know, very minor discussions with the tree warden. There's these three street trees that are noted on the plan that we've been discussing. And certainly all of those will be protected. And I really disagree with the fact that this far one towards the corner, I, I mean, there's no branches coming to that. For, I mean, 15, 20 feet in the air. I don't have a, you know, a, a picture of it here, but I don't feel as though that's going to be impeding anyone's view as far as coming to and from the street. I, and I don't know if anyone... I don't think people are flying off the parkway onto that street too often. It's, I mean, I don't think it's really a cut through. People stay on the parkway there. Um, are but, you, you know, aren't you going to be planting a tree with respect to conservation as well? Well, the, the plantings that they're requiring are, are quite extensive all over the property. And I, I'm also willing to commit to this proposed hedge, Christian, that is um, certainly willing to put that in any, you know, anything you guys want as far as that order of conditions, because I'll certainly try my best to keep that, you know, that's definitely going to be in there. I didn't just put it on here to not do it. You know what I mean? So that would definitely be something that we would definitely take care of. Absolutely. And the whole mm -hmm. point here is we, we try to do all this the best way we could as far as keeping the, the new property out of the flood zone. And it's that which we've been able to do. And that's the reason for this whole meeting tonight is to do that. And the other part of this whole thing is the, the conservation and we're trying to, we were trying to work with them and we had several meetings We had quite a few plants, that whole backyard, it, it doesn't show here, but there's going to be plants all over the, you know, all of, the majority of that yard is going to have quite a few plantings there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm willing to commit to that coffin. The tr trees aren't going to be damaged in any way. We'll certainly have those protected during construction. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, that is, that, is, that is certainly good to hear. Um, because uh, that that is a, a big concern, and I suppose it is a subjective issue about whether or not that curb cut is too close to the intersection. Um, uh, however, I would uh, suggest discussions with the tree warden that aren't just passing or minor, but you we do need a tree plan, and that will have to be uh, approved by the tree warden, um, which is different than the Conservation Commission's purview. Uh, and uh, that that would be a good thing to occur. Certainly, if there are going to be increased plantings, that's all that's all good news. Um, uh, also, and within the building being within the front setback is uh, okay. I, I can address that. The current building, just so everyone knows, is actually closer to the street than this one is planned a little bit by not a lot, it, but it is. And then the average setback, I, I haven't had any discussions in some time with the building inspector. Um, but as far as my understanding goes, and the way they've looked at this in the past is they use an average of the houses on the street, and that's covered on the plan that you guys have, Christian. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's where we got the that average. That is how they do it, Mr. Mahoney. Yes. 
Well, I guess I'm. And I believe on this plan, is that average front is, I believe, listed as 11.8, and the house is proposed at uh, 12 foot nine. Yeah, I wanted to give us a little, a little room to mess if we got, you know, <clears throat> inch or two. Right there. So this isn't furthering a nonconformist, Mr. Chair. That's correct. That is correct. That this property will need to have a, you know, a, it still has not been submitted for permit, but it will need to comply with all the zoning bylaws. Right. That that's uh, good to hear. One one last question, and I'm not sure there's an answer to this one. Um, I know that curb cut is what is at issue here, but I do have a question: Does the current single family home have flooding bait, flooding problems in its basement? Yes. No, I'm asking the uh, Mr. Uh, Chair, the people. Not that I'm aware. I don't want to. I haven't lived there, so I, I can't answer to that. Um, I have not seen any water in there. Um, I know there's been some talk of people saying that it's flooded for you know tens of 10, 30, 10, 20, 30 years, but I, I'd be lying. I don't know exactly. I haven't seen any water in there, but um, right now it's empty. I did let a friend live there for some time um, that was going through a tough time and they've moved out a couple months back. Um, but like I said, I didn't hear any water stories from him. Um, so I, I'd be lying. I don't know uh, too much. Of, I really don't know how to answer that because okay. as far as I know, no. Um, I know there's been some, again, we're, we're not doing anything. This is all we're reducing the impervious area that's currently there. We're actually reducing it. I know it sounds hard to believe, but this was all gone through with conservation and uh, they're very stringent on what they allow. And we try to do everything we could to please those guys to get this sure. thing approved. And we did. All right, Bill, that's okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Um, so I know we have no um, new speakers on the list, um, but everyone who has spoken before seems to want to speak a second time. I would, uh, Ask people who are looking to speak a second time um, to limit your comments to new information. Um, if the information you're providing is something you have already provided, I ask you to um, uh, to consider in the in the you know whether it's whether it's necessary to raise the the same issue a second time. Um, but the order that I have um, is Preston for a second time. Yes, it is slightly different. If you give a permit for the second driveway and they put it in according to the tree laws protecting public trees, um, they would have to remove it because it is definitely too close to that maple tree. And the DBH calculation is used to say, to calculate how much root space will be needed for the tree. And um, according to my calculations, because I went down and measured it, the driveway is much too close to the tree and would have to be moved. And if it gets moved, it will be in the regulatory floodplain. Okay. Thank you. And just to clarify that you're referring specifically to the, the what on the plan is the curb cut to the right. The, which is labeled as proposed curb cut. The second driveway, yes. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, Ms. Hindley for a second time? Yes, thank you. I just wanted to respond to your comment that this was limited to the, the second driveway, and I understand that, and I really appreciate that, the, that we're going beyond that, but this is our chance to speak. And uh, I would submit that since the Conservation Committee met, the effects of global warming and climate change have devastated the world and our country. And you must be, Mr. Klein, a wonderful public the service. We hold the first. You got it. To be, uh, sorry. Norfolk Island has Bounty Day, honoring when just. Sorry. Um, you must be a wonderful public servant to be doing such a difficult job. And we appreciate what you're doing, but basically I'm appealing to you to go beyond your purview and uh, draw attention to your colleagues to uh, these really serious concerns that we've expressed tonight. Thank you very much. Appreciate, very much appreciate your comments and your compliments. Um, next, I have uh, Dave DiLorenzo for a second. Uh, thanks again. I'll limit my comments to drive driveway related. Uh, 
um, items uh, specifically. Um, I, I want to um, reinforce the point made earlier that um, cars indeed turn off of Mystic Valley Parkway very quickly. Um, and so the proposed 50 feet um, um, would not seem to us to be sufficient. Um, uh, and I think that should be definitely taken into consideration. It definitely is used as a cut through. Further, the um, the road, as as Serena Bray mentioned, is is used for non-resident parking routinely uh, to um, to access. Uh, it, it, it's a burden on the street already. Um, people who are um, um, coming to um, enjoy the river and the lake, there isn't enough alter alternative parking. And so they routinely on, on weekends um, in the summer park on our street and, um, and create some congestion, which just gets back to, um, in my mind, the insufficiency of um, the present driveway scheme to service a building of 4,500 square feet and two units. There's just no way that's going to be enough parking for the residents. And they will inevitably, they and their guests will add congestion to the street. And as parents of two young children, uh, it's, a, it's a great concern to us as well. So just wanted to add that. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, and then um, Ms. Bray for a second time. Um, sure. So I can speak to um, um, Mr. Mahoney. He doesn't know about the flooding, but because that time when you, your um, friend was living there, that was um, a drought. We just happened to be in a drought. But before that, um, my property has been flooded. The whole street on Maynard has been flooded. Um, that's why those pumps were put in place, because there's um, continuous flooding issues. Um, on all the properties and I'm higher, I'm like higher and I'm out of any of the flood, out of the FEMA maps and I get flooded. So that's kind of my experience from being a resident for about how many years since 09. So um, it does flood um, and it really, just, it, it's unpredictable the, the weather these days. Um, and the speed at which the cars come, there's multiple accidents where cars flip over. They actually break um, one of our other neighbors. Cars continuously break through because they're speeding so quickly. He has these um, barriers put on his corner um, so that cars don't fly into his backyard because that's actually what happens. This happened just a few years ago where a car took the turn too quickly and his the car crashed through his fence. Um, so there are cars that go really quickly. And then, you know, that's also unpredictable because it could be, there's no control. You know, it says what the speed limit is, but people don't obey that speed limit. Great, thank you very much. Was there anything further? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, then uh, Mr. Seltzer for a second time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to raise a quick legal point regarding the questions that Mr. Moore had over the non-conforming setback of this property. The bylaw that provides the exception for using the average setback of other uh, buildings on the block uh, specifically says it's for the development of a vacant lot uh, that they may use this exception. And I don't know what the board's opinion is of whether this is considered to be a vacant lot to be developed. Thank you very much for that. Um, that's a determination for the, the inspector of buildings, unfortunately, it's not, it's not in our purview on this hearing. Um, are there any other members of the public who wish to address this hearing? Being none, I am going to go ahead and uh, close public comment for this hearing. Um, so, so we'll return this question now to the board. Um, so we received significant testimony from the public um, in regards to a lot of questions, obviously a lot of it dealing with the flooding and the location of the property um, and existing issues in the neighborhood. Um, while the the sort of the location of the house on the property, the size of the house, um, the flooding issues are not directly under our purview. Um, whereas the board is is being instructed to to review the 
the case of the second driveway, I do ask the, you know, the certainly the questions about safety um, and security of the corner um, are with under our purview. Um, and again, the, the findings that the board is required to make if it was to uh, find positively uh, for the second driveway is that the second driveway may be add, only added in a manner that avoids an undue concentration of population, um, may add it in a manner that allows adequate provision of transportation, and may be added in a manner that conserves the value and of land and buildings in the vicinity. Um, those are the specific findings that we're required to make under the zoning bylaw. Um, are there uh, questions and comments from the board? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hanlon, it seems to me that the issues relating to the preservation of the street tree, um, and I, I do want to footnote here that we're applying 3.3.3 as well, because this is part of a special yep. permit. And so consequently, considerations that are relevant under that provision may be relevant, even if they're not one of the three that the chair just read. Uh, but in any event, we've always paid attention to whether or not a second driveway would adversely affect uh, street trees. Um, and we have Ms. Preston, who's gone out and done a measurement and calculated it. Uh, and th I mean, that certainly is evidence. And I respect that. She's, as many of you know, been quite an advocate for trees in, in this neighborhood. Um, but I don't really know how to resolve that question. It's, and I, I wonder if, I mean, I, I don't want to put Mr. Moore on the spot, but as the representative of the tree committee here, so to speak, uh, what should, what could we do about that? It, it seems to me that it would be significant, uh, both in terms of our historical practice and because of uh, potentially conserving the value of, the, of land and buildings, uh, whether or not in, at the end of the day, that street tree uh, will fail, presumably from an inadvertent damage that comes from the builder doing the best he can to preserve it, but we can perceive, perceive that that is wrought with difficulties. Uh, so I wonder if you, through you, Mr. Klein, uh, you, you could invite Mr. Moore to help us figure out what, what the facts are with respect to this. Mr. Moore, can you address the questions of compliance with uh, the street pre tree protection, is that under the jurisdiction of the tree committee? Uh, uh, certainly, uh, I'll be happy to respond. Um, Steve Moore, uh, my previous comments certainly were as a private citizen with very large interest in trees. These comments are related to my uh, Arlington Tree Committee membership and what I know about that situation. Um, probably in the past, we've had situations like this where there's been potential for significant impact of large scale construction on street trees. There have been some pretty extensive conversations with Tim McQueeve, the tree warden, um, because he's the gentleman that's on, on, the, on point when it comes to monitoring, number one, compliance with the rules to do with protection of the critical root zone that Ms. Preston mentioned. Uh, and number two, also keeping an eye on the health of the tree following, because as Mr. Hammond points out, uh, often the, the failure of a tree happens substantially later than the development, long after the developer and the, the, how the construction is completed. So I guess I would suggest that number one, they develop a tree plan that's done by, a, a, as the law requires, by a certified arborist, uh, number two, that that plan uh, be discussed and approved by the tree warden. And number three, that they would take into account specifically the methods and intent. I, I know the developer already said this, but the, the, the methods and, and intent to, uh, to do that protection, because as Ms. Preston rightly points out, doing a curb cut and creation of a driveway that close to the critical root zone of the street tree, which the driveway will impact. I can tell you because it's usually uh, one foot radius for every DBH inch. Um, and this is not a small tree that, 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 that 
could potentially be an issue and so, and unfortunately badly impact the health of the tree. Mr. Handler, I'm not sure that I've completely answered your question. Mr. Chairman, I think Mr. Moore has probably done the best he can under the circumstances. So Thank I appreciate you. I appreciate the advice that he's given us. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Mr. DuPont. So just following up on Mr. Hanlon and Mr. Moore. So oftentimes when we are discussing uh, construction and the effect it has on trees, we're talking about the construction process itself, uh, not necessarily the placement of either a structure, or in this case, a driveway in proximity to the tree. So this isn't just a matter of for the period of, you know, three months or six months, whatever it would be for building, um, that we're worried about having adequate whatever shielding. We're now talking about something that if actually placed where it's proposed to be placed could in fact uh, have a, a detrimental effect to yeah. the tree. And so where we oftentimes have, you know, approved a, an application, we've said that the, you know, builder, uh, the owner will work in concert with the uh, tree warden and develop a tree plan. But this is actually different than that. This is not a temporary item, as I just said. This is something where there has to be, in my mind, some evidence of the fact that just by virtue of putting a driveway there, it's not going to have a detrimental effect. So that's that's one issue I have. I have to say, as to the overall proposal, I have concerns about the safety of these two driveways. Um, and I, I've heard residents make observations. It's somewhat anecdotal. I understand that um, about the idea that if, if people are parking tandem, uh, that those cars are going to push out toward the sidewalk and potentially cause people to walk off the sidewalk. And in particular, the concern is with children. So I have a concern about that. I, I don't necessarily understand the dimensions in terms of what the parking would be. It looks like they're suggesting side-by-side -side parking at the end, but I do have a concern about the parking toward the street um, and that it would, number one, force people to move off the sidewalk onto the street and secondly, that um, the sight lines could be affected because it's a fairly congested area. I, I know it fairly well. I travel down there with some frequency. I think that there is some supposition that's being made on the part of the applicant that this is not a cut through street. And I don't think that that's true. And I think that there's also some presumption that traffic coming around that corner is going to be going at a you know, a reasonably slow clip so that it's not going to present some sort of a danger. And I don't know if that's true either. I know driving on that stretch where you're moving along with people behind you coming around the curve, if you've got to take a right-hand turn, you can't just put your brakes on, put your blinker on and your brakes on and without the danger potentially of having people rear end you. So I have a concern about the proximity of that curve to the uh, to the street, you know, the uh, street uh, intersector, and uh, so that makes me question, you know, at the end of it, just the adequate distance of the first driveway that's proposed closest to Mystic Valley Parkway, in terms of whether or not that's adequate at all for a second driveway. So I don't know what my conclusion is, quite honestly, with regard to those things. But it almost strikes me that there should be traffic data, and I realize this is onerous for a person who's developing, you know, just a, a residential property, but I don't feel like I have a good handle on what the dangers are that are presented by the things that I've just raised with regard to traffic safety, uh, you know, the, the um, placement of the street, the idea that sight lines are maybe going to be tough for pedestrians, including children. And then the idea that parking could force people off the sidewalk. So I, I have real reservations about this for all of those reasons. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Um, there, 
other questions or comments from the board? Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Um, the, I wanted to talk, raise the question of um, the, um, the, the setback um, and the what, what the the significance of the of the calculation of the average of the average setback, which substantially reduces what would ordinarily be done in the bylaw, and I get that uh, this property is already non-conforming, and that conceivably we could be working under uh, under uh, Chapter Eight, but the one of the provisions of the of the very section of the bylaw that we're talking about is in no case may a second driveway for a single family, two family, duplex, or three family dwelling violate any other dimensional or density regulations for the district in which uh, it is located. And I'm not quite sure what that means in this situation, uh, but it does it does raise a question that I like to think more about about what it if if it turns out. Uh, that the average is not what it's calculated to be. Um, is there any likelihood that that second that that sentence may be violated? That the, that under the circumstances, the thing that we're being asked to approve is a thing that that can't be approved. I'm not quite sure exactly what they're trying to get at here, uh, but it is some somewhat troubling to me that. Uh, that the front setback is so small. It's not just a matter of playing with arithmetic. It's that several of the things that Mr. DuPont pointed to uh, are the product of the fact that this is very tight in the front and there's not enough room to do what I'm sure the developer would pr prefer to do if he had more space to to do it. So mm -hmm. I'm not 100% sure that I think that that questions about the about what the actual setback uh, should be, whether those are totally irrelevant. I'm, I'm not sure that they are relevant either, but it it does it it does accentuate the discomfort I feel for the on, on some of the points that Mr. DuPont raised. Thank you. Um, I'm sort of scribbling here in the background, um, sort of lots of thoughts about what Kinds of restrict what kind of conditions the board would want to consider um, should the board wish to uh, proceed with um, with an approval on this project. But I also hear, you know, from the members that not everyone um, thinks that that is necessarily the the way that we should go on this. Um, and so I, I think it's it's good to you know, have a have uh, you know more more discussion among the board. I did have one question for the applicant um the curb cut to the left which is the nine foot proposed curb cut relocation um if you could just explain sort of the nature of that relocation i, I don't i don't have it directly in front of me um the old one i mean that's very similar to what's there um i, I mean based on the comments here tonight i was i was thinking maybe we should put this off and i'll try and Get a little more information from the. I'll sit with the tree warden number one, mm -hmm. and then maybe try and even. I, I don't know if I could have the ability to do a traffic study, but I mean maybe I could even go out there and and I want to you know possibly look at you know I I think one of the neighbors is directly across from me at six their driveway, but I'm not sure, so I don't want to say that without maybe I can get a little more information for you guys to consider and you know continue this to you know whenever you guys can have the time to see me again. There are certain issues, Bill, that they could, uh, if they wanted to decide it this evening, they could, such as the tree issue. Uh, the safety issue is a, I guess, is a different issue for certainly Mr. Uh, for Mr. DuPont and certainly for Mr. Hanlon. Uh, so they may want more information on the safety issue. Uh, I am trying to conjure up in my mind uh, a way that there could be a vote subject to conditions subsequent. And uh, I, I'm struggling with the, uh, the idea of 
dealing with a safety issue without perhaps doing more, okay? But uh, I'm gonna leave up to that up to the members of the board. Uh, you jumped the gun on me, Bill. I was going to wait to see what Mr. Klein had to say uh, before I uh, basically asked whether the matter could be continued. Okay. Uh, but I'll leave it up to Mr. Klein. Oh, thank you both. Um, are there other con so the as sort of outlined by um, by Mr. Mahoney and Mr. Nessie, the issues that are really before us that the traffic concern, the traffic safety concern, is something that you know, should probably be discussed with the transportation planner in town um, to sort of get their sense as to what would be appropriate, um, and they if they you know. If if their recommendation is that you know it needs to be a greater traffic study, um, I wouldn't imagine that would necessarily be their recommendation. But um, that's certainly something you can discuss with them. Um, uh, the concern about the trees is definitely something that you know a more substantive discussion with the tree warden, uh, generation of a tree plan with appropriate setbacks as required, both under town and state regulation. Um, that would certainly be something uh, that would provide a, a you know a much greater sense of degree of comfort um, into how that would work. Um, I think to provide the vegetated buffer, it would be good to provide, um, you know, at, at least, you know, f you know, 18 to 24 inches between the closest point on the driveway or parking to the property line, just to provide that extra space. So well, I don't have that on the left. Yep, um, I can, yeah, I can, that's a simple thing. That's simple to do that. And then uh, per Mr. Hanlon's point and you know things that were were raised uh, very nicely by the you know some of the residents, um, that the you know we under we all know that there are going to be two cars in each of these driveways, um, and so it would be appropriate to have to make sure that the driveways are long enough to accommodate that. Um, and so right now I know that it's basically a, a twelve foot nine driveway leading to a, an eighteen foot parking space. Um, I think it would be helpful to explore making the if the driveways could be 18 feet as well, um, so that we do not have cars that are overlapping the driveway. I mean, overlapping the sidewalk, um, because certainly that's a that's a you know a major safety concern uh, if kids and people have to walk into the street because cars are blocking the sidewalk, even though that's not it's not permitted in the town of Arlington to park your car on the sidewalk. Um, you know, a thousand people do it, but it's not, it's not allowed <laughs> under, the, under the town bylaws. Um, uh, some of the other comments, um, you know, that were specifically mentioned, there's a lot of concern, you know, about the speeds. That's something that we should be taking up with the uh, transportation planner, uh, you know, on-street parking. Obviously, that's something that in town right now that's being looked at for overnight parking. But I do want to make sure that we have enough space between the two driveways to have at least two full parking spaces. Um, and it'd be good to have at least two full parking spaces uh, between the proposed curb cut and the corner. Um, I know that that sort of impacts the ability for people to turn the corner, but people are going to be trying to park there anyways. Um, Kristen, I'm trying to, excuse me, I'm trying to understand. So right here it says that between, currently there's 57 feet between the two yep. curb cuts. That's the perfect. Two driveways. Yeah, that's worth the money. And then the other thing I just want to ask, because I, I don't know how simple that's going to be. You want me to extend these driveways in into the property more? Is that what you're saying? Is that what you're asking? That I, I would like you to take a look at that to see if the, so right now the driveway, basically the, I don't know exactly what the distance is from the sidewalk to the start of the parking space. Okay, yeah, well, it's about. I think that's that's twelve feet nine inches, if I'm not mistaken. That's what it says. That's pretty much what it is. That's okay. where that. That's what that. Yeah. So I, I don't. What I'm, I'm just trying to figure out what you're asking, and I'll certainly do my. Well, best. If you could, if if so, if you could take a look at extending that to eighteen feet from twelve foot nine, oh, and to so see if six feet, that's a possibility. Yeah, that would require me to go back to conservation because I'm certain. I think I'll call David Morgan and ask if I could okay. do that. Maybe I could. 
I just put some uh, crushed stone at the end of that driveway and, and, and they could pull in deeper and they wouldn't have a problem with that. I don't know. I'd have to ask. Yeah. Just the, the concern just being that at 12 right now, what would happen is someone would park in that parking space and there's only 12 foot nine and then they would park another car there and it would lap onto the well, side. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not arguing that that stuff does happen. <laughs> I, I understand that. Um, And obviously the flooding issues are things that you guys are going to have to work through. Um, there was a quest, there was concern about protection for that electrical box. Um, depending on the proximity of the curb cut to the to the electrical box um, and the sort of the alignment between the driveway and the electrical box, if you could take a look whether, you know, providing a protective bollard might be appropriate. Um, Again, I may push, maybe I can push that over. A I don't know how far it is right now without talking to the survey and having them get an exact measurement, but maybe mm -hmm. I can push that over a little bit and get rid of that fireplace on the out, that three foot buffer. And, you know, I'm going to try and push the, yeah. So I, I've got some work to do and I'm willing to try, and, you know, so hopefully okay. we can it out next time. Flipping through my various notes here. Uh, that's again, the public tree bylaw questions about flooding, talking to the tree warden. Um, and then the pedestrian safety. Um, I think that was the bulk of the com comments that were related specifically to um, to the second driveway. Um, so, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hanlon, I just wanted to uh, underscore. Mr. Mahoney's willingness to get together with the tree warden and take a a really hard look at at all of this. Uh, Mr. Anessi was kind of ho hoping that we could do that with a condition, and I believe actually that Mr. Moore dictated a very fine condition if we can rely on conditions. But conditions are language, and reality is reality. And one of the things that we need some advice on is whether or not, with the best will in the world, we can have adequate assurance that the trees that we're talking about can be preserved, including with not just from construction, but from the implications of actually having a driveway there. And if we're going to take the time to do this, we need to do it right. And I think that before the board entrusts all of this to a condition, which may or may not be workable, we'd like to have at least a foundation laid that if we did have a condition like that, it would have the desired effect. Thank you. And and also to that, that point, uh, they're the, speaking with David Morgan, the town's conservation agent. Um, it would certainly be difficult if the board imposed a condition that was in direct opposition to a condition from the Conservation Commission. Um, so I think it's good if we can sort of work together to try to come up with with something that meets the needs for for both boards. Um, is there anything further the board would like the applicant to consider before they come back before us? Seeing none, um, the next scheduled date the board has is Tuesday, September 26th, which is obviously starting to get a little dense. <laughs> um, does that provide the applicant sufficient time or do you want additional time beyond September 26th? No, I think that's good. I'll get right on this. I'm not going to waste too much time. I'm going to try and get with David and I'll call those guys tomorrow. Okay. We ha have other people we need to speak with as well, Bill. Okay. Not just yep. David Morgan. Yeah? Understood. Did that give you enough time? Yeah. I'm going to, I'll get on the phone with all three of these. Tim, the, the tree warden I've talked to many times about several different plants. This isn't my first time speaking with him. And David, I'll certainly talk with him. I'll, I'll call all these people. And then the traffic transportation planner, I don't know who that is, but I'll have a conversation with them and see how they feel and possibly meet them out there as soon as I can. All right. Let's go with that date then. Okay. Um, with that, then, can I have a motion to continue the hearing for Five Mystic Lake Drive oh. until a date certain of September 26, 2023 at 7.30 p.m.? Mr. Chairman, so moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Is that a second? Thank you, Mr. Is that Mr. DuPont, is that an affirmative? Yep. 
second. Okay. Uh, so the motion before the board is a continuation of the hearing for five Mystic Lake Drive until a date certain of September 26, 2023, 7.30 p.m. Uh, vote of the board. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. Ms. Hoffman. Aye. And the chair votes aye. We are continued on five Mystic Lake Drive. Thank you all very much. A special thank you to um, the, the residents who, who came out for this hearing and, and spoke before us. And uh, thank you to the applicant for their willingness to um, have further conversations with the town on this matter. Thank you. thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Okay. Going back to our agenda for tonight, that brings up docket 3762, 148 Mount Vernon Street. Uh, if I could ask the applicants to introduce themselves and tell us what they would be liking to do. Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm Allison Lasko, and this is my husband, Brian. We are the homeowners at 148 Mount Vernon Street. Um, We've lived here for a little over four years, and we are here because we are looking to do a modest addition at the rear of our house to accommodate our growing family in the neighborhood we love. Um, and we are seeking a special permit um, for relief from the two and a half story rule found in the dimensional and density table of section 5.4.2. Um, and if I could share my screen right now, I would love to pull up some drawings. Colleen, can you help her with that? All set. All right. All right, so what we're showing you here is, um, this is the front of our house, which you can see um, is just a standard two-story house, but because of the um, slope of our yard, it slopes from the front to the back such that we have a walkout basement in the back shown in the lower elevation here. So our existing home is um, here and the proposed addition we're looking to do is in the back here. Um, I have one more just to show this from the other side. So at the rear, here is our, the addition would be um, basement foundation, first floor, second floor. Um, and because of the height of our ceiling and the average existing grade, our existing home um, is actually considered a three-story home um, based on the zoning bylaw definition of a basement as a story. Um, and the last document I'll share with the screen right here is our um, professional survey done, um, in which case they, they did all the calculations and they have on here that basement is considered a story. Um, so we don't believe that this addition will substantially be more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing nonconformity. Um, so there's no change in use um, other than we're just trying to get a little more space in our kitchen and um, another bathroom for our family. Um, so I guess at that point, if you guys have any questions or need us to explain anything further, we are ready to go. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, so just to confirm with you, I do have a, a note from the uh, building inspector that the structure is an existing non-conforming three-story single family dwelling in an R1 zoning district. Um, and this is a building, this is a proposed addition. Um, and as such, under section uh, 8.1.3b, uh, which is non-conforming single or two family dwellings, an increase in the non-conforming nature of a structure will not be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than an existing condition. That's the finding that the board needs to make. The board needs to find that the proposed increase in the non-conforming nature of the structure will not be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing condition. Um, and reviewing the, um, the information, um, that was provided in the dimensional parking information. Um, the front yard depth is also non-conforming, but there's no change. Um, there will the, currently the left side yard, right side yard and rear yard are all compliant and they will also be compliant after 
uh, this work is completed. Um, the building is below the maximum height. Um, the only question that I had come up, uh, and this is very sort of futzy, uh, to, for lack of a better term. Uh, so usable open space, the minimum is 30 uh, for, for this district. Uh, so 30% of the gross floor area has uh, has to be usable open space in the yard. Uh, the number that is currently listed on the form for usable open space in the rear yard is 756 square feet. Um, and doing the calculation, the usable open space percentage comes out to 0 0.2998, uh, which obviously is you know, to the fourth decimal point out of compliance. Um, but looking at the plan, I think that the area that's usable open space is larger on the lot than 756 square feet. Um, so I, I don't think that you're creating a nonconformity, but I would ask you to uh, confirm that 756 square feet of usable open space um, and, and confirm what that actual number is, because I, I think it is actually larger than that. I, um, and it would need to be at least. Yes, I believe you're right. I think on our calculation sheet, it was around at least a square foot larger to, to yes, meet the it requirements. Was, it was rounded down to 25 feet for our calculation, but per our survey plan here, it's 25.3. So, yes, what do you need us to do? <laughs> <laughs> so basically, just you'll need it for the for the final application. Um, and we'll we'll include it uh, should the board move forward to approve the. Uh, the special permit, we would just include it as a condition that you resubmit the dimensional and parking information with the updated figure. Um, so with that, are there questions or comments uh, from the board? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I have a, just a quick question. Uh, I wonder if Ms. Lasko could comment as to whether there are other houses nearby on the street or in the neighborhood that have as, have uh, similar additions to this? Um, yes, there are multiple houses on our street. Um, our neighbors completed a project just very recently with the same thing. And it's because the whole side of our street is, the front yard is level and the backyard slopes down. Um, and multiple houses have the first and the second floor addition as well. Thank you. Um, if I could, Ms. Lascos, I could just ask you to uh, stop sharing the screen. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. No, nope, not at all. <laughs> just realized I can't actually turn that off. So <laughs> are there other uh, questions from the board? Seeing none, I will go ahead and open uh, this hearing for public comment. Uh, public questions and comments are taken as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing the decision. Um, the members who wish to speak should raise their hand using the button on the reactions tab. Um, or if you're calling it by phone, dial star nine. Um, so with that, uh, the first name on our list is Mr. Moore. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, just a quick question. I was I was looking at the uh, the drawings related to this application, and um, I guess I would ask through you to the applicant: Is that garage currently part of the basement? It looks like you already have a garage in the basement. Uh, that's correct. We the garage is existing, and it's full of stuff. <laughs> as, uh, Mr. Chair, as is my garage. Um, <laughs> um, um, what, I, what I don't quite understand and don't know enough about how it works for the calculation of usable open space and the setbacks in which a driveway can exist and such, front and side. Um, so the driveway currently goes to the back of the house and you can somehow access that garage there's not enough room for a car turnaround, I guess is what I'm saying. So I was yes. wondering if uh, part me... of this project is going to be impinging on what exists of the current rear yard further than is currently impinged upon since 
the turnaround aspect would have to be pushed back with the addition that's being created on the back of the house. Yeah, so it appears, and I would, I would ask the applicant to confirm, so the existing driveway essentially remains the same, but as you note, the, um, there is a portion of the proposed addition that would overhang the driveway, but I believe that overhang um, occurs a Above the ground level, where's that rear elevation? So that the this is the addition at the basement level, and then at the first floor level, it steps out. So there's no impingement on the existing driveway or the existing garage door. Um, is that correct? That is correct. It's very question. important. Oh, okay. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yes, that, that is correct. Yeah. This, this does not affect our driveway in any way. We absolutely do not want it impacted as we park side by side as it currently is. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, uh, Mr. Chair, the, the, the point that I'm making though is that by adding an extension of the rear of the house towards the rear of the property, whatever turnaround aspect is acquired to get into that garage via an automobile, has to be pushed farther back into the existing backyard. And I don't know what the setback rules are oh. for a, a turnaround mm -hmm. or a driveway or such. Even though the entrance to the driveway is currently um, exists, once you cover that up and push that back, mm -hmm. you have to push the turnaround farther back. And I don't know how that is. So the calculations. Sure. So the proposed addition is not the full width of the back of the house, it's a partial width of the house and the location of the existing garage door is not changing. Oh, okay. So, the, so, so access to the garage will not change. Okay. I, I see what you're saying though. I wouldn't want to turn my, I wouldn't want to park, try and park in that garage. I could, uh, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome, Mr. Moore. Are there any members of the public who wish to address this application? Seeing none, I will go ahead and close public comment period for this hearing. Uh, so the Issue before the board. So this is an existing uh, single family home on a slope, steeply sloped lot so that the rear of the house is has the basement exposed, which creates a condition where the basement is considered a story. So this is an existing non-conforming three-story building. Um, they are looking to put an addition on the rear of the structure, uh, which will um, extend this existing nonconformity and as such uh, can be permitted only with the uh, finding of the board that uh, the proposed increase in the nonconforming nature of the structure will not be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing condition. And the way that the board typically does that determination is by considering the seven um, uh, different uh, categories for a special permit, um, which are the first is that the requested use is allowed or allowed by special permit in the district, uh, which this is and the use as a, as a single family residence in a single family district is allowed. Um, the requested use is essential or desirable to the public convenience or welfare. Um, the use of, of property in Arlington is uh, is useful and desirable to the residents of Arlington. And obviously uh, most of the houses in uh, this particular part of town are were constructed in the 1920s when houses were considerably smaller um, and expansions to these houses are desirable for uh, main maintenance of the desirability of the property um, and the usefulness of the property. Um, the required use will not create undue traffic congestion or impair pedestrian safety. Um, as was stated, the driveway is not changing. The number of inhabitants is not changing, at least not those of drivable age. Um, and the driveway can only really accommodate a couple of vehicles. So this will not uh, be an issue. Uh, the requested use will not overload any public system. So there will not be a noticeable increase in the uh, use of utilities uh, by this property, uh, by this addition. The requested use will not impair the character or integrity of the neighborhood. Um, as was uh, questioned and answered by the applicant, this is a, a common um, addition that one sees in this neighborhood uh, where 
there are these additions off the rear of the house uh, to provide uh, additional additional living space and additional uh, bedroom space. Um, the required use will not be detrimental to the uh, public health or welfare. Uh, there's nothing about this uh, this addition that would impact the health or welfare um, of the residents. Uh, the requested use will not cause this in the use detrimental to the neighborhood, uh, which is true as well. Um, there's also a question of uh, whether there are any special regulations involved, and the only special regulation is eight one is the, the what we had stated, which is section eight one three b, which is that the board needs to find that the increase in the non-conforming nature is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing condition. Um, does the board have any question in regards to um, any of the findings that the board needs to make? Being none. Um, should the board choose and vote to approve this application this evening, uh, there are three standard conditions that the board would apply. Uh, the first is that the plans and specifications approved by the board for the special permit shall be the final plans and specifications submitted to the building inspector of the town of Arlington in connection with this application for zoning relief. There should be no deviation during construction from approved plans and specifications without the express written approval of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, number two, the building inspector is hereby notified that is to monitor the site and should proceed with appropriate enforcement procedures at any time determines that violations are present. Building inspector shall proceed under section 3.1 of the zoning bylaw and under the provisions of chapter 40, section 21D of the Massachusetts general laws and institute non-criminal complaints. If necessary, the building inspector may also approve and institute appropriate criminal action also in accordance with section 3.1. And condition number three, the board shall maintain continuing jurisdiction with respect to the special permit grant. Uh, with that in mind, are there any other conditions that the board feels would be important before they could act upon this application? Mr. Chairman? Mr. Hanlon? Um, I believe that you had an interchange with the applicant before about updating the figures on usable open space uh, at the time of building permit review, and I think that we should probably include that. Okay. Okay. So, um, I would uh, the applicant is to provide a revised and signed dimensional and parking information and open space slash gross floor area sheets, correcting any deficiencies discussed at the hearing to the inspectional services department for review. I believe that is the one I was looking for. Are there any other conditions? Any other questions? Seeing none, I would ask for a motion. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, I move that the board approve this application subject to the three standard conditions that the chair read into the record and the additional um, condition regarding the tabulation of open space, usable open space that the chair also read into the record. Second. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. So the vote before the board is the motion to approve a special permit for 148 Mount Vernon Street with the four conditions that were read into the record. Um, vote of the board, uh, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. And the chair votes aye. The motion carries. Um, so as we had mentioned before to the applicant, um, if you can just have your the surveyor just revise um, that data sheet so that we have the usable uh, open space corrected. Um, and so the board will draft a uh, decision um, based on the vote just taken uh, and that will be voted on uh, hopefully at our next hearing. And then um, you can proceed with the, talking with inspectional services about next steps. Great, thank you. Thank you. Great, thank you.
So that, oops, <clears throat> get my paper clip on here. Okay, that brings us to the next item on our agenda, which is docket 3763, 56 Newcomb Street. I really appreciate the patience of the applicant. Uh, if I could ask them to uh, introduce themselves and tell us what they would like to do. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and if it please the members of the board, my name is Mike Flynn. And I'm with my wife, Nancy. Hello. Hello. Hi. Uh, so what what uh, what are you proposing to do? Um, well, we have a uh, we're in an R2 and we have an existing two family. Um, we propose to essentially an interior remodel of the primarily the second floor unit. Um, the um, use is, uh, will we continue to be a, a, a two family, so the use isn't changing. Um, we are already, uh, as with the prior applicant, we're already a non-conforming lot in terms of um, projections into minimum yards, section 5.3.9, subparagraph capital D of the zoning of bylaws, uh, as well as maximum lot coverage in terms of the GFA. Um, which is in section 5-16 five, five districts and uses, uh, page 64 of the bylaw. Um, what we're seeking, so we're already non-conforming. What we're seeking to do is um, to further uh, project into the rear setback. Um, we're currently at 13.5 uh, feet, more or less, uh, plus or minus. Um, we're looking to extend another three feet um, and that will add an additional uh, five feet, um, 35 square feet on both the first and second floor. However, what we're doing there is not, um, it's a, a screened in porch on both floors, um, uh, which will uh, allow for a few things. One is uh, we're also adding a, a, a deck or a balcony to that, which will increase some of the open um, outdoor usable area, uh, but on the first floor will also provide um, easier access and safer access, both uh, in and out of the property, um, and as well as uh, access to the rear yard. That um, is very important to us um, for a couple of reasons. One, the project or proposal is designed to um, increase our use and enjoyment of the property and, and to bring it up to um, to modern standards, it's uh, hasn't been touched uh, or remodeled in decades, um, and um, so you know we're looking to do that. We intend to age in place here, and, and, and we hope to grow older. Well, we're already pretty old, but we, we hope to grow older here, and, and hopefully this is the last place for us. Um, so we're looking to to make it more livable. Um, the other thing is on the first floor. I'm, I, I hesitate to use the term tenants. The first floor is occupied by my mother and father-in-law, Nancy's parents, who are 89 and 94. Um, right now, we have a rear staircase um, that, that um, they can't use um, that provides access both to what is currently the rear porch area and the backyard, as well as the driveway and the basement. Uh, it's a dark... Uh, if it was built today, it wouldn't comply with the code. That stairway turns. Um, it's very dangerous and dark. What we're proposing uh, to do, and, and this is one of the reasons that we need to go back, is to allow the, to, to provide an entrance right where they park their car. And at the end of the driveway, they don't have to come around. They come in and they go up into their apartment. And then from there, they can also go down to the first floor. It also provides easier access and safer access for us um uh, to get to our floor so um that's it in a, in a nutshell um i rely for more detail on, on what we supplied um and it just kind of parry the language uh that that um is required for a special permit under section 3.3.3 .3 that um our proposed use will not impair the integrity or character of the district or the neighborhood or be detrimental to the character of the neighborhood and will otherwise comply with the criteria set forth in 3.3.3. Um, I hope that kind of 
gives an overview and we're happy to answer any further questions. That is great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share the drawings that you had submitted. Um, okay. So this is the, the, the plot plan. So the outline in red, uh, if I'm reading this correctly, this is the proposed addition on the first and second floor, and this is the proposed uh, deck at the second floor level. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, perfect. Um, so this is the, the proposed first floor plan. So this is, um, they explain this is the extension of the space for the first unit. This is the elongated stairs. Um, yep. Mm -hmm that are being provided. And then this is at the second floor level. Um, this is the landing for the stairs here. Uh, this is that the porch. And then this is the deck um, as had been uh, described. And that there's also a third floor plan, uh, but this is all, I, you may, are you adding a dormer to the rear? Is that what this no. is? No, already existing. No. Okay. Yeah. Already existing, so there's no yeah. no implications on the third floor. No. Um, so here, there's a partial elevation from the what would be the right side of the house from the street. So you can see the deck and the proposed addition uh, from the. Uh, this is from the, the from rear. the rear. So this is the addition here with the deck up at this level, um, and then this is us. I believe us oh this is from the other side right so this yeah, is that's the, the driveway that's from the driveway right. side yeah that's in the driveway side okay perfect um and then this is just structural plan so again this is it um the one question i had had with the application um was the this is one of the few additions i've seen where the gross floor area is being reduced um and i just want to make sure that that was i was reading that correctly we apologize for that con confusion. Um, we had, a, I guess, a typo. We have submitted a, a, a revised. Um, we, they have the revised. Yeah, uh, right. But the revised um, calculations show an increase, and that increase is oh, okay. Is a total, like I said, thirty-five feet on each floor. If you, if you, uh, Mr. Chairman, would scroll back yeah. um, uh, to. The plans. There you go. Yeah. Uh, if you keep going back. Um, oh, well, that's that's all I have. Or is okay. Let me. That's the first one I have. If I could share share my screen. Absolutely, Colleen. Can you allow that for them? All set. I hope I can. Do Thank this. you. So, um, this um, this is what appears now. Um, and on the agenda, these are the materials. So you can see <clears throat> that we have, there is actually an increase in the gross floor, floor area. If I've done my math correctly, it is 35 square feet on each floor. Okay. And um, that is shown a little bit better in uh, essentially what our architect, uh, David Harmon has done is he's indicated in black here, um, the amount that is that's where we're increasing the gfa as you can oh, see okay. and so so it's it's it, it, it i i don't necessarily object to the use calling it an addition but it, it's really just an extension of um what is what is currently a porch that really isn't being used on both floors mm -hmm. and um we're extending it out to make it more usable and it's essentially becoming a screen porch on both floors um, and this is okay. now scrolling down to the second floor, which shows again that additional 35 square feet directly above. Um, I, I hope that clarifies things, and we apologize for um, for that. No, that's fine. Um, could you just scroll back up to the, the oh. that page that had the numbers? Okay, again? sorry, I'm sorry. Right back. Yeah, uh, probably this one. Yeah, if you just bring that one up, yeah, that's the one. So, um, so the first floor. Okay, so all these numbers are. So we're going from so that we're now going from forty-eight fifty. 
up to 4920. Okay. Um, got it. Great. Thank you. Um, all right. If you want to go ahead, you can take that down again. Sure. Um, so going over the, the dimensional and parking information, um, as I say before, uh, there are this lot does have a number of existing non-conformities. Um, it's non-conforming in regards to overall lot size. Um, it is not compliant with in regards to lot coverage. It's already over uh, at 39%, and the proposal is to increase that. Uh, the front yard depth is um, non-conforming, but there is no change to that. The right side yard is non-conforming. There's no change to that. The rear yard depth, um, currently approximately 13.5 uh, feet, which is non-conforming. And so the proposal is to increase uh, the nature of that non-conformity from 13.5 to 10.3. Um, the only ch other change I would make on the space is regards to usable open space. Um, looking at the site plan, uh, it appears that you have zero usable open space today. Um, and that number will not change. Uh, so the area of usable open space um, in both categories will be zero and the percentage will be zero, uh, which is fine. Um, and then I think everything else is fine. Um, are there any questions from the board? Seeing none, I will go ahead and open the hearing for public comment. Public comment is, takes, is taken as it relates to the matter at hand. It should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Those wishing to speak uh, should use the raise hand button under the reactions tab in the Zoom application. Those calling by phone may dial star nine. Um, public questions are to be addressed to the chair. Uh, are there any members of the public who wish to address this hearing? Once going twice. Seeing none, I'll go ahead and close the public hearing. Um, so what the board, uh, excuse me, the, the public, just the public portion of the hearing. Um, so what the board has before us is nearly identical to the case immediately proceeding. Um, this is a an existing, in this case, two family dwelling that has is is a has existing nonconformities. Uh, the applicant is proposing to uh, increase the nonconformity in regards to the rear yard setback, and in order for that to be allowed, the board has to uh, make a finding that the increase in the nonconforming nature of the structure will not be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing condition. Uh, the board typically does that by reviewing uh, the required findings for a special permit. Um, so the first is that the requ requested use is allowed or allowed by special permit in the district. Uh, this is a two-family dwelling in a two-family district that is allowed um, within the district. The requested use is essential or desirable to the public convenience or welfare, um, making the existing homes in Arlington that were often constructed with um, constraints, especially in the stairwells that are difficult to navigate, especially as, as we all are getting older. Um, appreciate the changing of the stairwell uh, in this house makes it uh, much more accessible to uh, a wider variety of people, and that is certainly within the um, desirable and within the public convenience. Um, it will not create undue traffic congestion or impair pedestrian safety. It's not changing the number of residents of the house, um, and it is not changing anything at the driveway that might impair pedestrian safety. Uh, will not overload any public system. There's going to be no increases to any of the utility requirements for the property. Uh, requested use will not impair the character or integrity of the neighborhood. Um, this is a, a very modest um, addition, as the applicant said, of 35 square feet on a couple of floors um, in order to uh, provide additional uh, living space and also to provide space for the expanded stairwell. Um, and that is certainly within the character of the neighborhood. 
uh, required use will not be detrimental to the public health or welfare. Uh, there's nothing about this application that would uh, raise any eyebrows in that regard. The requested use will not cause an excess of use detrimental to the neighborhood. Um, it is certainly not doing anything along those lines. Um, and then uh, the question is whether there is any special regulation that is required, and that is the determination we are making in regards to Section 813B about the increase in the non-conforming nature of the structure not being substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. Um, so those are the findings that the board would need to make. Um, are there any questions of the board in regards to either the application or the required findings? Mr. Team. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, I have one thing. I, I'm certainly not, I'm unfortunately not looking at paper that will tell me this, but uh, my recollection at the beginning is there was a question about lot coverage, which doesn't change the yes. analysis any, but if that is also a nonconformity that is being extended, we should probably refer to it. Absolutely. Yeah, so the it is the both the the rear go back to that page. Yeah, so the changes are both in lot coverage and in the depth of the rear yard. Uh, those are both being increased. Uh, and then there is the technical increase in uh, nonconformity with the usable open space requirement because that is the amount of usable open space is determined by the gross floor area of the house. The gross floor of the house is increasing, but the usable open space is not increasing because it is already zero and cannot be increased because of the dimensions of the lot. So it's those three different categories that need to be um, that are a part of that of that. So I appreciate um, Mr. Hanlon bringing that forward. Um, any other questions from the board? None. Um, the board has the three standard conditions, which were just read into the, the record for the prior hearing. So I'm going to go ahead and waive the reading again. Um, I would also uh, request as a an additional condition that the, um, I, I know the applicant has provided it, um, but I just want to make sure that the app that we, the board has um, revised and signed dimensional parking information and open space gross floor area sheets, correcting any deficiencies um, discussed at the hearing. So we discussed the the applicant the application was different from what the the from the revised. So I just asked to that the applicant just again so just resubmit that revision so that we have that for our record and that that accompanies the uh, building permit application. So, um, are there any other conditions that the board may wish to um, consider before voting on this matter? Seeing none, the chair will entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Uh, I move that the application be approved subject to the standard conditions and the one additional condition regarding updating the record that the chair has read into the record. Second, Thank Mr. Mr. Hanlon. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. So this is a vote of the board to approve a special permit for 56 Newcomb Street with the four conditions as read into the record. Um, vote of the board, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. And the chair votes aye. That special permit is approved. Um, and so um, the board will vote, will write up a written decision based on our vote tonight. Uh, that'll be approved um, hopefully at the next uh, hearing, if not the next hearing, the hearing after that. Um, and then at that point, um, the decision will be ready for being reported with the town clerk. And then um, you can move forward with inspectional services on issuance of a permit. Great. Thank you very much. Good luck. You're Thanks. welcome. Thank you. Good luck. Appreciate Thank your patience you. tonight. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. So, alas, our business as a board is not done because I pushed a bunch of stuff to the end. So, apologies. I have to keep you guys here. Um, so, going back to item number two on our agenda. 
um, which is the, the uh, vote to approve the meeting minutes from July 25th, 2023. Um, so these are our uh, minutes that were prepared by our own um, Colleen Ralston, uh, submitted for uh, uh, notes and comments. Uh, are there any further uh, comments in regards to the minutes for July 25th? Seeing none, uh, may I have a motion to approve the minutes from July 25th? Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Second, Hanlon. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. So this will be a vote of the board. Ms. Hoffman was not uh, um, at the July 25th hearing, so she is exempt from this vote. Uh, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Those minutes are approved. It brings us to item three on our agenda, which is the um, approval of the meeting minutes from May 30th, 2023. Um, these are also minutes that were prepared mm -hmm. by Ms. Ralston, submitted to the board for questions and comments. Are there <laughs> any additional questions or comments um, in regards to the minutes from May 30th? Seeing none, may I have a motion to approve the minutes from May 30th, 2023? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon? So moved. Thank Second. you, Mr. Hanlon. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Again, Ms. Hoffman was not present for May 30th. Um, vote of the board, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Uh, Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Those minutes are approved. Here's item four on our agenda. Approval of meeting minutes from May 11th, 2023. Uh, again, prepared by Ms. Ralston submitted to the board for questions and comments. Are there any additional questions or comments in regards to the minutes for the May 11th, 2023 meeting? Seeing none, may I have a motion to approve the minutes from May 11th? Mr. Chairman, so moved. Thank you, Mr. Hammond. Second, Hamm. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Again, Ms. Hoffman was not at this meeting. Um, vote of the board, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. The chair votes aye. Those minutes are approved. Um, so that is the end of all of the official business on our agenda. I did want to uh, remind the board that we do have a meeting on September 5th uh, to begin to deliberate the decision on 10 Sunnyside Avenue. Um, Mr. Hanlon has been trying very hard to get us a revised copy of the draft decision. Um, which we will distribute to everyone as soon as it is available. Well, Mr. Um, Chairman, I the revised copy should be in, in everybody's. I sent it around earlier today. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. I have not seen that yet. I will take a look for it. Um, so that will be Tuesday, September 5th, will be the initial deliberations on 10 Sunnyside. If we need additional time, we have already set aside uh, Tuesday, September 12th for that. Um, and we need to be completed by the 24th of September. And then uh, the next hearing date we have scheduled for regular hearings um, will be Tuesday, September 26th, which I fear now already has five items on it. Um, but we will move forward as such. Um, so that is our upcoming schedule. And with that, um, I would like to thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. I would especially like to thank Colleen Ralston and Michael Champa for their assistance in preparing for and hosting this online meeting. Please note that the purpose of the board's recording of the meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of its proceedings. It is our understanding the recording made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the Zoning Board of Appeals website. And to conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. Mr. Chair. Mr. Moore, I'm afraid you can't make that motion. You're the only person who can't. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chair, I would draw on my attempt to, uh, to move closure of the meeting. No, I... Um... <laughs> I wanted to just tell you that the public does appreciate the completion of the minutes. It, it is important. And I, you know, I know I'd raised a, a question about that before. Yep. And um, I thank you for, thank you for doing all that. I know minutes can be a lot of work, particularly on your board. Um, 
secondarily, was the last item, the uh, 148, whatever it was, uh, moved to the next agenda, the last item that had been on tonight's agenda? No, so both 56 Newcomb Street and 148 Mount Vernon Street were voted on and approved. No, no, I mean the last item, which I can't remember the address on, 212 something other. 212. Oh, 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 sorry. That one, we, we moved that up to the front. That was continued till September 26th. That's what I guessed. That's going to be a long yeah. one. Thank you. They had, they had received some new information from the zoning board, from the building inspector, yeah. and they requested time to consider his, his new comments. Okay, thank you. That property certainly is fraud. Thank you. It's, uh, you're very welcome. So with that, I will again look for a motion to adjourn from a board member. So moved, Mr. Chairman. And seconded, Thank Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Vote of the board to adjourn, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. The, and the chair votes aye. We are adjourned. Thank you all very, very much. Good night, everyone. Look Good forward night. to seeing you all um, on the fifth. Thanks.